content of this channel is for mature audiences. Parental discretion is advised. You've tuned in to the Green Gorilla Channel. Please make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell notification button. And please, feel free to share the video. Thank you. Check, 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 man. What's cracking, everybody? I'm Gigi. And you're tuned in to the Green Gorilla channel, man. Peace and blessings, man. Happy Sunday to everybody out there. And uh, before I get things started, man, I want to give a shout out to all the haters out there. I know y'all lurking, as always, man. But shout out to y'all, man. I hope y'all having a good afternoon. When you come in, man, can you please uh, hit the like button, subscribe button, and the bell notification button so you can stay on top of what's cracking here on the Green Gorilla channel? And uh, like I always do, man, I want to give a shout out to all the members of the Green Gorilla channel on both uh, YouTube and Patreon and then get, you know, to the business at hand. So shout out to Brotherly Love, Devon Love Ridge, Ishmael Samad, The Watcher, Barnolas, Hostile Adep, The Cold Hearted, and Cold uh, Revelator, Lee Ways, Black Men Being Brutally Honest, Michael Ross, Lord Hamal, and Kill the Game. Big up to y'all, man. <laughs> Big up to BGS Ivmore, Dr. Thunder, Jason Hills, Charles Finney, Interesting Thought, Bim Rock, Blacksword 404, Until I'm Not, Apex Prowler, and Naomi Gary. Thank you so much. <laughs> Big up to Jay Cleveland Green, The Toxic Masculinist, Pulpit 28, No Sleep, Broken Blade, Mr. King, Larry R., Seth Sun, Afro Troop TV, and Show Me. Big up. Big up to Spain Man, Seven Coast Dojo, Anthony Davis, I'm Just Jules, An Honest Look, Sherlin Woe, Ricky Dawson, Stefan, Julius Ferguson, and True 70, excuse me, Truth 7360. Big up. <laughs> Big up the call for president, Mr. Me Too, Gold Professor, AKs and Curtains, H Town, Roguish the Billmonger, Adrian Thomas, Electrician 480, Binga, and Cutting Up with the Jones. Big up. <laughs> Big up Zanko, 1D, Scott, Path, Guy, Pete Rock, Aaron Peters, Lindsay, Quiz, The Poet, Black Wizard, Jazz Tech, and Shadow Observer. Big up. <laughs> Big up Artists and MC, Troy Warren, Mrs. KP Bailey, Alan Wiley, The Face, Life of Commerce, Dream Lit, Timothy Blewett, Jeffrey Speed, and Marvin Battle Jr. Big up. <laughs> Big up Adam, Ignat, Smiles, Brian Peace, Black Uru, Dr. Tree 33, 77, Base X, Brian McMurray, Cameron S, Charles Rogers, and Rick Ross. Big up. <laughs> Big up Sandra Jean, Charles Gilmore, Greg, Barry Little, Mr. Valentino, Cameron 87, Dr. Rock, Mark Swift, Odd Collard, and Donna Watts. Big up. <laughs> Big up Coach Hotep, Old Soul Chief, Mr. Blue Collar, TD Hip Hop Media, Drew Main, Mr. Heat, and Sir Anthony. Big up. <laughs> also, MLR, Universal 178, Rasheed Barnes, Aaron Smith, DH, A Double, Dr. Tia San Johnson, Kalonja Kala. W Pierre One. Can't forget David Carroll, Force Windu, and Kevin Samuels. Big up to all them, man. <laughs> On the Patreon side, big up to Robert Wicks, Passport OG, J E K, Chris Flowers, Christopher Burton, Prince D Martini, Daxby, Lamar, J Live, Rashawn Phillips Sewells, Keith Bass, Nick, Malcolm Smith, Rock One, Judah Arenda, Albert C, Dr. Ben Vincent, J. Cleveland Green, Charles Fontentot, I'm the Light of My Father, Waffle Weave, Everell uh, Meadows. That's too many people, man. I know I ain't got all them people, man, at the same time, man, being active. So I apologize for that. But, uh, yeah, Tyrone Hampton, Dornell Smith, Excalibur, Pursuer Prisoner, Taz, Dragon 59, Jay Bailey, Mr. Michi, Mo Mal, and the same. Well, big up to all y'all, man. <laughs> big up, man. And if you're wondering how you could, you know, if you want to become a member and support the Green Gorilla channel on an ongoing basis, man, this is how you do it. I'll be back with the regular business, man. What's good, everybody? I'm the G with a PhD, and you're tuned in to the Green Gorilla Channel, the place where black men can express themselves freely, straight up, no chaser. Today, I want to introduce you to my new membership program that consists of five levels where you can invest in the Green Gorilla Channel on a monthly basis and receive level-specific perks. Memberships are special because they improve the quality of the content of the channel and will help me to be able to keep the channel going. 
Now, to participate in the Green Gorilla Channel membership program, all you have to do is hit the join button, which is located right next to the subscribe button on my channel page. Now, for all of my subscribers who decide not to participate in my membership program, nothing will change. The content will keep coming the way it always has. Thanks for watching, and be careful out here, people. Bless. All right, man, what's cracking with y'all, man, out there, man? Again, man, happy Sunday. I see y'all out there. Shout out to Desalines, Charles Faulkner. Woo! Uh, what's up, Jay? Uh, cutting up with the Jones. What's cracking with you? Muaji, the magnificent Ra X, Ron Matthews. I see you out there, Miss Queen, Sun Kiss. I see y'all out there. Anyway, man, I, you know, I had no plans on doing this, man. Black in effect. You know, he uh, hit up the internet, man. You know, Gmail or what have you. He sent an email out like, can anyone do the Black Manosphere show of the week tonight? I know it's super last minute, but it's, need it's needed. So I'm like, man, if I got to do this, you know what I'm saying? I, I didn't really prepare anything for real. Uh, but it was something that I had planned on doing at some point. Talking, you know, about intersectionality again. Taking a look at it again. Shout out to Salty Balls. I see you out there. Shout out to Leon uh, 008. He says in the middle of buying a house. Good luck with that. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to Indigo Flow. But anyway, man, I just, you know, I felt it was my duty, man. I I, just, I said, let me go ahead out, you know, and, and help Black in effect if I can. I don't want to uh, leave the, the slot blank. You know what I mean? So anyway, man, let me talk about this issue, man. Intersectionality, man. I mean, y'all, you didn't heard about it before. Uh, for the most part, it's a you know a theoretical framework, uh, an analytical tool that is supposed to you know understand how various social and political identities like race, gender, class, sexual orientation, and disability. They come together, they intersect, and they overlap like a cage or like the, you know, like the various uh, parts of a cage that bars of a cage that kind of like interlace or overlap over each other. They do so and intersect uh, to create unique experiences of oppression for certain people or privilege for others, right? And it's supposed to highlight the ways that these interconnected identities contribute to the complexity of individual experiences and they shape societal structures, systems, and institutions. That's what it's supposed to be. And the term intersectionality was coined by a black law professor. Her name is Kimberly Crenshaw. I think y'all all know that at this point. Okay. Uh, she, she basically coined the term, uh, she was an American civil rights activist, and still is, uh, a legal scholar, a philosopher. Uh, she published this, you know, uh, a paper called Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex. That was the name of the paper. And it, the, the subtitle is A Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination Doctrine, Feminist Theory, and Anti-Racist Politics. Right? So that's where the term intersectionality was coined. And since then, the concept has evolved and it's been adapted by various academic disciplines, social movements, activism efforts, and so on, emphasizing the importance of looking at or considering multiple overlapping identities when addressing social justice and inequality issues. So, uh, Era Black says, does intersectionality affect people's dating or their relationships? It can but, you know, like, I tell, I tell people, man, all the time, like, my channel, for the most part, man, like, if you got girl problems, I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 problems, but a bitch ain't one. I'm just going to keep it real with y'all, man. Like, I don't be, I, I don't get caught up in all that bullshit. You know what I'm saying? Like, who dating who? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I, you know, I'm here to talk about justice-related issues for black men and boys, for real. That's my primary focus. So, you know, if you're worried about what these bitches out here doing or what, you know, how they feeling and, you know, how they perceive your ability to, you know, be a mate and a husband and all that kind of shit, man, I'm not really interested in that. I'm just keeping it a buck, man. That's not like what I focus on. But it can impact 
you know, your employment. It can impact, you know, your relationship as it pertains to the subject matter of sexual assault or domestic violence. So yeah, it, it can play a part. <laughs> it can. It definitely has an impact on how you're looked at and how you're treated. Definitely. You know what I'm saying? So uh, this first paper, you know, this, the, the first paper she wrote about the issue is called Demarginalizing the Intersections of Race and Sex. Okay? That's the first paper she wrote. Now, as far as I'm concerned, at this point, the first paper she wrote, the concept was relatively harmless to black men because it was turned outward. It was worried about how institutions, like corporations in general, right, uh, marginalized black women. But the paper she published in 1991, marginalizing, uh, what was the name of the paper? Mapping the Margins. That's the name of it, Mapping the Margins. Intersectionality, Identity Politics, and Violence Against Women of Color. The, now, when, it, when that paper is published in 91, it turns inward. It turns away from looking at power structures interracially, and then it turns intraracially, and it starts pointing the finger at black men. Basically saying that black men are sexist, rapist, abusers. That's just the way it is, bro. <laughs> So David Burt says, uh, do intersectional feminists ever take into consideration Jim Sedanius' uh, black male target hypothesis? They have. There's a paper uh, that was written by a group of women, uh, maybe a woman and a man. I can't recall, man. Uh, but it's about invisibility, intersectional invisibility. Uh, I think the paper is written by uh, Valerie Perdue Vons and uh, Richard Ibot. And uh, it's called Intersectional Indivis uh, Invisibility, the Distinctive Advantages and Disadvantages of Multiple Subordinate Group Identities, okay? And in this paper, she basically, you know, well, Richard and uh, Valerie, or uh, Purdue Vons and Ibach, they try to make the case that black men are privileged in the sense that they are looked at, they're hyper-focused on, okay? So, and the reason that they're focused uh, are brought into focus more so than black women is because men in general are privileged. And so black women, not, uh, black women not being looked at or perceived, you know, as a threat somehow is a disadvantage, you know, it creates this invisibility because they're overlooked and perceived as powerless and, you know, not, not strong. And basically it's, it, it tries to take what I would consider to be uh, a benefit and to try to turn it into a burden. And, you know, it, it, all I'm saying is, and so that basically say, well, they're overlooked and black men are given recognition. And in so being given recognition, they're privileged. That's why they get the recognition black men do. But, you know, a person like Curry's going to come along and say, this is not recognition in a positive sense. This is misrecognition. Man, you know, one of the persons who came up with the whole concept of the idea of misrecognition is uh, Charles Taylor, a continental philosopher. Uh, but I'm not going to even get into all that. You know what I'm saying? But, but at the end of the day, you know, I'm, I'm here to talk about it uh, to a certain extent. I'm going to show you some video clips. But right now, I, I just want to say something about it preliminarily. Uh, so, you know, the first paper, you know, is an exploration of three court cases. Okay, and the first court case is called the Graffin Reed versus General Motors. That was the, you know, like the first foray into intersectionality is about black women suing corporations and then trying to claim that, you know, on account of them being black women and, you know, on account of them being women and black, that there's some sort of double jeopardy that they face to a certain extent. So in... The first case, you got something called the Graffin Reed versus General Motors. And it was a federal court case that took place in 1976. Now, of course, Kimberly Crenshaw wrote this article in 1983, but the court case happened in 1976. And it had five black women 
African-American women and they sued General Motors and they alleged that there was gender discrimination from General Motors in their employment practices. Now, the case is significant because it addressed the question of whether plaintiffs could combine claims of race and sex discrimination under Title VII, which is the Civil Rights Act of 1964, okay? Shout out to uh, Ghetto User. Shout out, man. He says, thank God for our scholars. Appreciate that, bro. And uh, shout out to David Burke. Uh, he says, thank you for answering uh, the question. I'm sorry if I don't get to uh, all of the questions. I just want to get through this immediately. Then I'll open it. You know, I'll open the, uh, you know, the uh, lines up, and then you can ask me whatever you want to ask me, all right? But I appreciate that. Thank you so much, man. So, uh, so yeah, so the plaintiffs, these five black women in this court case against General Motors, they claim that the company's seniority system kept uh, discrimination going by disadvantaging black women who had been previously excluded from certain jobs because of their race and their gender. And they argued that they experienced something that was unique. It really wasn't called intersectionality yet. But they argued that they experienced intersectional discrimination. Now, again, the term wasn't yet coined, but it referred to a unique form of discrimination faced by individuals who belong to multiple marginalized groups. So that's what the, you know, that's what the court case was like, okay, and what it was about. So the, the, the court case took place in the Eastern District of Missouri which is close to, you know, my hometown, St. Louis, okay? Uh, and the court ruled against these five black women, and they said that Title VII did not allow them to combine race and sex discrimination claims in a single lawsuit. Said you can't do this at the same time. You, you can do one, but you can't do both, okay? So the court basically said that if you allow the combined claims, it would create something called a super remedy. <laughs> this is some crazy shit. Now, uh, this is the language of the court. This is a new super remedy is what the court said. And this extends, extends beyond what Congress intended when it passed Title VII. Okay? So, go look it up. It's called De Graff and Reed. D E. G-R-A-F-F-E-N-R-E-I-D versus General Motors, okay? And uh, now there, are, of course, you know, in retrospect, there are people who are criticizing the decision uh, for its narrow interpretation of Title VII. And, you know, the court's alleged failure to recognize the unique challenges faced by individuals who experience intersectional discrimination, okay? So you got legal scholars and activists and they argue that the ruling overlooked complex ways in which race and gender can intersect and create distinct forms of discrimination that aren't adequately addressed when you just look at race or sex by itself. So in the years since uh, this court case, the graph and read, the concept has basically is gained more recognition in legal and academic circles and you know, people just focus on that case, okay, in order to show what they think is a, a way in which a federal court missed the mark, okay, uh, in understanding and addressing black women's oppression, okay? Uh, an odd note, an odd fact, okay, uh, the lead attorney for this case, DeGraff and Reed versus General Motors, was a woman named Frankie Muse Freeman, okay? was a you know civil rights attorney and an activist. Uh, she was the first woman appointed, this is a factoid, right, appointed to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights and played a crucial role in several civil rights cases through her career. Uh, she was involved in more than just the graph and read, uh, but in numerous cases uh, aimed at ending segregation and promoting racial equality in the U.S. Now, of course, again, she didn't use the term intersectionality, but this is the precursor for the concept, right? Now, it's also 
important for people to understand that, like, this is a precedent in the law. And, you know, like, in order for individuals to, you know, get their way and to have something be a precedent, you know, it, 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 it's an onerous task, okay? So the Graf and Reed and General Motors has never been overturned, okay? Now, there's some people who, you know, are critical of the decision, but it's never really actually been overturned. And there's not been a newly established precedent, for real, for real. I mean, one can argue that because there's two other cases uh, in, that are talked about or discussed in this paper. Uh, but like the Graf and Reed and General Motors has not been explicitly overturned. Just just in case you don't know. OK. Now, there's another case. And it's called Moore versus Hughes Helicopter Incorporated. OK, so it's a, it's a, black, it's a case of a black woman suing a helicopter company. And this is a federal court case again, and it took place in 1983. Okay, and it also addresses the issue of what can be what can be considered to be intersectional discrimination. So you got an African American woman. Her name is Doris Moore, and she filed a lawsuit against her then employer, Hughes Helicopters, and she basically said that she was subjected to sex and race discrimination, which violated Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So in this case, Moore versus Hughes Helicopters, Moore basically argued that she had been subjected to a hostile work environment, not just because of her sex, but also because of her race. So the U.S. District Court, and this took place in California, the Central District of California, it acknowledged the possibility of intersectional discrimination, stating that the plaintiff's claim of race and sex discrimination is not mutually exclusive, and the court would not view them in a vacuum, okay? So although the court ultimately ruled in favor of the defendant, which is Hughes Helicopters, okay? So Moore did not win this case, okay? Hughes Helicopters won. But it's, the case is important because it demonstrated one court, the Central District Court of California, to acknowledge, right, that in, the intersection of race and sex could occur, so that this could happen, okay? So unlike the De Graffenried and General Motors decision, which said that we're not doing that because that's going to be a super remedy, okay? So anyway, to help, uh, the case helped contribute to like the evolution of a legal landscape where intersectional discrimination would be, you know, accepted. Okay. Now there's another case. Uh, and it's, uh, called Payne versus Travanaugh. And this is the last case mentioned in this, in this paper. Okay. Payne versus Travanaugh, okay, was a federal court case. And shout out to uh, BGS Hipmore. Big up to him, man. Shout out to you, bro. Big up, man. Appreciate that, man. Shout out to Passport OG, man. Shout out to that brother as well, man. Shout out. Again, man, like I'm doing this impromptu at the last minute, but I'm, I think the shit is important, man. You understand what I mean? Because... What started off as an interracial movement or a movement against, you know, injustice experienced by women in the workplace, it then took a step forward and it turned into what I consider to be, you know, uh, dominance feminism. You know, it, 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 it took a turn. And we, here we are still in that turn as far as I'm concerned. So it, it, it took its focus away from corporations and businesses, and then it focused the shit on black men. And here we are today, you know, like talking about, well, black men aren't protectors and black men are abusers and rapists and sexists and shit like this. So, uh, you know, it's important for people to understand how all of this started and the various, you know, points of departure from one step or one stage to another, okay? 
So anyway, the third case is called Payne versus Travanol. Okay. Payne versus Travanol Laboratories. And it was also a federal court case. Uh, and it's from 81, though. And it dealt with intersectional discrimination based on race and gender. And it involved an African-American woman. Her name was Emma Payne. And she uh, filed a lawsuit against Travanol Laboratories, which is still in existence. It's called Baxter International. And uh, she alleged that she was subjected to race and sex discrimination in violation of Title VII, okay? Um, she claimed that she experienced discrimination as a black woman that was distinct from discrimination faced by black men or white women. And she basically alleged that the company's layoff and recall policies disproportionately impacted black women, resulting in their being laid off at a higher rate and not being recalled as frequently as either white women or black men, okay? So this case took place in the Northern, uh, the Northern District of Illinois, okay? And she actually won the case, okay? Uh, and she presented to the satisfaction of the court, I assume, that she uh, basically, uh, you know, was discriminated what the fuck is that, man? Anyway, um, let me let me hold on, man. Something, something. I got some kind of vocal thing going on with my phone. Hold on for a second. Siri, I didn't have your bum ass nothing. Yeah, somebody spying on me. You know, you know when we do this kind of work, man. You know, we get we get looked at. <laughs> All of a sudden, Siri, my shit don't Siri don't ever pop up on my phone. Now she asking questions and shit. <laughs> anyway, um, she said she got she was the first to be fired or laid off and the last to be called back. And to the satisfaction, I guess, of the Northern District of Illinois, uh, she was able to demonstrate that you know. Uh, this ha actually occurred. And, and uh, so this is the first case in which it was, you know, a position of which, you know, like a court basically acknowledged intersectional cl discrimination claims, okay? So uh, it paved the way for a broader recognition of these kind of claims under Title VII, okay? So in case you didn't know, that was it, okay? That's how I started off. Now, I would say, look, I don't have a problem with that, like, initially. Okay, like, at this point, as long as it's a directed to external discrimination and oppression to some degree, okay, re I really don't have a big, big problem with it. But then, the next thing that she did was she wrote a paper, again, it's called Mapping the Margins, intersectionality, identity politics, and violence against women of color. So it, it, it took a leap away from talking about justice related to corporations, and it moved to talking about black men being batterers. And then like black women, when it comes to, you know, them being battered, they got ignored, whereas white women were, you know, more protected and taken more seriously related to the claims that they made about their subjection to intra-racial violence, okay? So white women were taken seriously, black women, they say, weren't taken seriously in relation to them being subjected to abuse or sexual assault, okay? So she says this renders black women invisible. Now, it's odd, though, and I think that, you know, like a person like Dr. Johnson can attest to the verity of this claim. The problem with it to me was at the same time that this paper was written, Kimberly Crenshaw had evidence that when it came to intimate partner homicide, black men were being killed more than black women. I think Tommy Curry talks about this. Uh, Ishmael Reed talked about this. Dr. Tia Johnson talks about this. The question is, 
How is it possible for you to have evidence at your fingertips? You're a scholar, an attorney. You know what's actually occurring empirically out there in the world. How can you know that black women are killing more black men as it pertains to the phenomena of domestic violence, but you decide that you're gonna hyper-focus on the impropriety of black men? How? How? And uh, yeah, if you can, man, make sure you like the video, man. And shout out to uh, some people who hit me up in the, uh, who hit me up on the cash app. That you know that that goes a long way. Appreciate the help. So shout out to uh, people who hit me up. I'm gonna make sure. Kline and Bimrock, big up to y'all. Appreciate y'all, man. Thank you. Appreciate that. So again, this you know. This is where we are. But I wanted to show you something else because oftentimes, you know, we tend to think that the academy is just, you know, a place in which everybody in it just accepts these, these new theories. And there's some people who push back against it. And I'm trying to demonstrate that there are various scholars who have pushed back against it. And one, the first clip is a, it's kind of a long clip. I'm going to stop it. Uh, but if there's anybody who wants to come in and comment on what I just said, or you got any questions, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do so. Okay. If you want, if you got a question that you want to ask while I'm doing this, or you want to join in or you want to participate, I'm going to open up the floodgates and give you the opportunity to do so. Okay. Now you don't have to, if you don't want to, but if you want to feel free. Okay. Now the first clip is, a. Uh, from a, a, a scholar, his name is Adolph Reed, okay? And, uh, you know, I kind of clipped, the, I clipped the, the video from uh, another cast channel. Uh, but, you know, hey, man, you know how YouTube is, man. You know, we, 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 we cutting and pasting and splicing like we sampling out here, man. But, uh, so let me play that. And then, uh, you know, because in my viewpoint, what you had was, in the 70s, in the late 60s, the activists, they needed a place to go, okay? And so what a lot of these activists did was they retreated to the university. They just said, fuck it, we're going to the university systems. And they found themselves entrenched in these environments. And, you know, now one can argue, like, these theories really are nothing more than apologies or defenses of why they should maintain their presence inside of these institutions. Okay? And I, I'm not... So, so, in other words, I mean, it's, the case has been made that, like, these theories really are nothing more than, like, defenses for, like, or, like, really veneers for economic driving force. N namely that, okay, I deserve to be here, uh, and here are the reasons why. And, and, and they create these theories in order to kind of apologize for their presence. You know what I'm saying? So let's look at the first one, man. So I'll stop and go as I go along. All of the social movements outside the academy were in, in, in retreat. And so, so that's what I was talking about earlier. So he says, like, you know, outside of the academy, all these social movements like were like receding. Their vigor had began to dissipate, okay? At the same time, what was happening inside the academy um, is that the uh, sort of uh, new post-60s uh, I mean, disciplines, right? Or, or areas, um, interest areas. Uh, Black studies, uh, women's studies, uh, you know, Latino studies were becoming institutionalized over the first first half of the 80s, depending on 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 where you were. It so, bam, there you go. You got black studies, women's studies, Latino studies, all of these new studies, which basically. Were fought for, I mean, you know, they were validated and demanded by, you know, minority students. You got black students. I think the first African-American studies or black studies program was in San Francisco. 
San Francisco State University, if my memory serves me correctly. But, you know, you got students who like, you know, storm campuses and boycotted and did sit-ins and stuff like this. And they demanded that they have access to education specific to their, you know, ethnic groups or identities or even women did the same thing. Right. So that was like the 60s, though. So now here we are in the 80s. And, uh, you know, people need to, you know, confirm, you know, the, the reason for which, you know, their presence is, is there. And so they, they have to develop some sort of, you know, academic work or they have to, you know, engage in some academic output in order to justify their existence in the institution itself. So you're seeing the institutionalization of black studies, gender studies, and they're coming up with theories, you know, in order to substantiate, again, their presence. It could be a tell that I think, uh, with the exception of places like San Francisco State, they were institutionalized faster at the fancy places than at the less fancy places. But they became institutionalized, and they were institutionalized in a funny way, in a way that, that, um, that, that encouraged them, and I mean the disciplines, really, I mean, not just the individuals, <clears throat> to make claims that were simultaneously intellectual and political or, or academic and, and institutional and political. So when people start talking like in the mid 80s, mid to late 80s about a special black epistemology or, or on the women's way, ways of knowing that kind of stuff, I mean, these are more at the same time more or less genuine or honest um, expressions of um, of um, a view of how the world works. I think a view of how the world works that's that's wrong fundamentally, but that's another matter. So you know, look. So he's talking about the evolution of something called standpoint epistemology. I'm not going to get into the you know all of the intricacies of that, but standpoint epistemology is something that says like, okay, well, women know things about the world in a special, in a new, in a new, uh, unique way, just based upon their situatedness as women. So they see and they know things as women that other people can't see and they can't know. So that, and that's how it goes, man. So that's one of the theories that kind of popped up to establish. I mean, it, think about it. How neat does that work? Like, okay, well, you need a, you need to keep women around because women have access to special ways of knowing shit and you, you'll lose out on it if you dismiss them in terms of their presence from the university. That's, that's wild. But, but, but they were that as well as um, materially uh, productive claim or potentially productive claims about the status of, of the fields, right? Uh, and I mean, I'll say this, like, I've, uh, uh, I guess I uh, should say it in duck, at least in a metaphorical way, but the notion, black, what was understood as black feminism is a product of that mo moment of institutionalization. And there, there you go. That's a bomb right there. <laughs> black feminism really is a product of the institutionalization of their presence in the university. But let me keep going. And if, and I mean, I, I recall like it was yesterday, I was teaching, right? Um, and I've kept waiting for somebody to tell me what's special about black feminism that's not encompassed either within black studies or women's studies. And often enough, what it gets down to is like, you know, distribution of faculty lines. Uh oh. There he said it. Like I could repeat it. Let, let me repeat it. Special about black feminism that's not encompassed either within black studies or women's studies. And often enough, what it gets down to is like you know distribution of faculty lines and budgets and 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 so forth and so on. And you know, I'm not saying that to. Um, uh, cast accusations at anybody, right? But that's just kind of a natural um, way that academic subfields and politics, um, I mean, develop, right? Like you get 
um, a certain kind of status if you're um, if your area of study is recognized as a program, you get a different kind of status if it's recognized as a department. And it was so easy, uh, especially given the history of those fields, right? I mean, their history uh, as coming into the university from, from struggles that had been largely based outside the university. I don't want to go down a rabbit hole. So that's important to understand. Like, so one of the things that he's saying is, okay, look, you start to see like the institutionalization of black feminism by black women being present in the university and trying to substantiate their presence there. And he's, you know, and then you start to get like justifications. And what it really actually boils down to is the distribution of faculty lines and the determination of whether or not there will be the establishment of either programs or departments. So that, I mean, this is about money. It's about resources. This is about justifying, you know, a person's presence within the confines of a specific institution, okay? Or their presence within the institutions, okay? This is what it is. Oh, uh, behind intersectionality for many reasons, but I'll just say two things. One is that, um, an irony about the notion is that it emerged partly as a response to criticism that um, the, the gross identity or like the, you know, I don't know, like the equivalent in the academic um, world of the continental identities, right? Uh, race, gender, um, that they didn't cover everything, right? Uh, and that it's, it, it, it was inadequate to, to posit something called um, a unitary singular black interest or perspective or a unitary singular women's interest or perspective. Part of the appeal of the intersectionality idea, and again, I remember this very well, was that it seemed to offer a promise to correct that um, and limitation but in fact, what it did was just the opposite, right? So it um, fractionates the identity. So there's more of them, but the, each one of them is treated like it's rounded off, right? Or bounded. And that's the other comment I wanted to make about it. Since I first started hearing about this 30 years ago, 30 years ago plus, I've been asking, okay, well, how do you apportion, right? I mean, how do you know what's the what's the, the woman's side of, 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 of the intersecting black woman uh, identity or what's the race side and how do you draw the lines between them? And fundamentally, how does this look in the concrete world of everyday experience? And uh, someplace or other I posited like a laid off black female, single mother, steel worker, <laughs> right? With some, maybe some other, characteristics, I can't recall. Which of those identities is the real one? And when I first read uh, you know, Patricia Hill Collins, who I've read before, um, I read Kimberly Crenshaw, like I thought, well, okay, but if, because she opens with uh, what you see is a function of where you stand, right? Which, you know. Standpoint epistemology. That's just, what you see is a, you know, a function of where you stand. That's standpoint epistemology. It's already not newsworthy with Monheim and maybe not even newsworthy with, with Marx, but Marx sure as hell is aware of it. Um, and, but then the next move is, um, so therefore as a black woman, you know, only a black woman can understand the experience of a black woman. And I thought, well, Wait, so why is that the only stop on the train, right? I mean, why doesn't it keep going? Right? Only a left-handed black woman can understand a left-handed black woman. Only um, a left-handed black woman under five, five foot two can understand, you know, height challenge black, black women, et cetera, et cetera. So there was never the argument about it, right? It always seemed to be a, a matter of a position looking for a theoretical justification. And in this take... <laughs> Man, that's... That's a strong indictment, but let me go. back to uh, where I was going about um, the retreat of the left inside the academy, because um, again, this was more uh, most prominent at the fancy places, right? But by, but like you know, into the 90s, 
um, people who operate in those fields of study wanted them understandably to have appropriate recognition as fact as academic disciplines and then the next thing you know uh, uh, so what do you want to do if you got an academic discipline well we saw what happened with cultural studies when it was imported from the uk it it gets Im embedded in in this discursive house of mirrors right uh that that uh, requires like high high tech or at least the, the appearance of of you know, high tech training to be able to interpret anything. Well, <laughs> so look, one one of the things that he's saying here, I mean, he's using graduated terminology and like a lot of fucking uh, you know academic speak. But what he's basically saying is, you know, like this is like what the continental philosophers did, especially the French philosophers, they came up with this arcane and uh, very difficult, dense uh, philosophical perspective, which is almost impenetrable. Uh, and you know, they, it, for the most part, one can argue that they were kind of imitating the specialized languages uh, or, or the forms of communication of symbols and, and shit like that in the hard sciences. They wanted something like the hard sciences too. Something that, you know, that kind of demonstrated that they had, you know, uh, a unique way of knowing things and the, uh, the kind of expertise that they had in the hard sciences, too. OK, uh, so so you get post-structuralism and post-modernism, uh, all of these arcane kind of concepts and ideas that flow out of them. Very difficult to comprehend and understand uh, as opposed to like like more simple, uh, straightforward uh, theories. Uh, and he's like, man, you know, like, in order to be able to demonstrate that you belong, you, you know, you have to cre create this kind of arcane nomenclature and shit like that, like a system of, of, of symbols. And uh, then you can claim to be an expert. And he's like, man, uh, you know, a, a lot like even like uh, Naam Chomsky, he's critical of this shit. He's like, man, there's a lot of this in and, and Camille Polly as well. Like a lot of this is just bullshit, you know, but but equalizer, what's cracking with you, man? Uh I brought you in, man. You got any comments thus far, though? Yeah, man. Uh, good presentation as usual. Just had a quick comment and I got to roll out. But, you know, this is, I guess in this space, you know, it, it unfortunately, you know, it's expected because, you know, they've already lost this supposed war that they still think is going on. I mean, they're not, I'm a numbers guy, so this is not, you know, I'm not looking down on black women or what have you, but they're not leading in anything positive. Right. The, the game is, you know, family and and the institution of marriage. They're not winning there. OK, so even though they're, you know, highly, you know, they, a lot of them are, you know, college grads and across the board and all, you know, races, the women, obviously, all of them have, you know, against the men versus men. There's more of them graduating than, than the males. So it's not such a surprise. But the issue is even though they have double and triple minority status, they're still at the bottom economically, period. The numbers show it. BLS, I mean, I give you all the sources. They're losing. Whether it's corporate America, they're at the bottom, even though they're capped in middle management on purpose. I don't know why they would think Miss Ann would allow them in their space, but whatever, okay? I'll give a perfect example where I work. CEO's a, you know, a white woman. Total compensation is over $5 million. Uh, her husband, who doesn't work there, is an attorney. She's still married. She's 72 years old, sharp as a tack. The mm -hmm. other thing is her, her, her son, who's a few years older than me, he's a senior executive. So they keep it all in the family. And, and, and you know, these black women think that they're winning. They, I mean, it's just sad, but they're not. Small business, same deal. They're not winning. They're at the bottom economically. With all of this affirmative action, they're still at the bottom. But it's black men's fault, which we know is not true, especially when we look at the numbers. It's really, really sad. And, and lastly, you know, I live in Northern Virginia, man, and I work in Bethesda, Maryland. So I'm right over there in PG County where a lot of these, you know, these uppity or what BJS was considered 92 black women are. I, I mean, look at the area. Is it thriving? No. Yeah, yeah. I, I, Unfortunately. 
Yeah, well, you know, one of the things people have to be mindful of is that, you know, like, if one part of the population <laughs> is kind of cut off, then you're going to have an issue. You're going to have problems, man. I, they say teamwork makes the dream work. You know what I'm saying? So if you if you got groups of persons, you know, who uh, don't have, you know, other, you know, partners or whatever, you know, like their significant others aren't like part of the political economy, then like what, what the fuck do you expect? <laughs> I mean, well, you know, like one, one could argue that the, the wealth gap is primarily, you know, uh, created by black men's marginalization from the economy. Correct. Line. That's that's Correct. just what it is. So, you know, they want. Uh, so, you know, it is what it is. But one thing I want to. Uh, I want to say is, you know, like Lightman says that she created critical race theory. She, she didn't do so single handedly. Okay, uh, if anything, you know, she had a part to play in it. Um, now, she she did create the concept of intersectionality by herself, I mean, or coin it by herself. I mean, there were precursors to intersectionality. One could argue that the uh, Carvey River Collective was the precursor to it. But uh, she was influential, you know, in, in critical race theory to a certain extent. But it's inaccurate to say that she created it single-handedly. Uh, critical race theory was a collaborative effort among legal scholars and activists and other intellectuals who were seeking to uh, develop new ways of understanding the persistent problem of race in uh, American culture. Uh, and then, you know, also elsewhere as well. But uh, critical race theory basically grew out of the 70s and the 80s. And uh, it was primarily among legal scholars who were dissatisfied with the traditional civil rights movement or approaches to combating racism. So it's, it is difficult to pinpoint a specific uh, or a single person or a group who created critical race theory, but you got Derek Bell, Richard Delgado, Gene Stefanczyk, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, Mari Matuzda, Patricia Williams. Those uh, several people who help uh, you know develop uh, critical race theory. So, you know, just just to let you know, I'm just I'm, I'm answering that question. But but at any rate, let me get back to. Uh, let me get back to uh, old boy right fast. Ironically, setting itself against, you know, conventional high bound national narratives, et cetera. Um, so that's part of what, what happens. And then quite accidentally, but even more insidiously, uh, the notion of the public intellectual takes, takes shape. And that idea came directly out of um, a book that my old comrade um, uh, Russell Jacoby did called the, the Last Intellectuals. Um, and it was good in some ways and kind of uh, romantic in some others, but the notion of a public intellectual as a, as an as an academic, well, and that's not really what uh, Jacoby was talking about either. But the notion of a public intellectual became an academic who comments on world affairs, and then somehow the the um, the boundary between academic work or other I mean, intellectual work and this public intellectual work dissolves, and all of a sudden, you know, like everything is everything. Uh, and by the middle or the end of the '90s, you've got a world in which um, scholars who operate in the subfields or the areas of of subfields that bear on um, people of color or women or gay, gay or trans people as objects of study or fields of study, um, somehow along the way, the, um, the mission of the scholar becomes less doing work that's more narrowly gauged and directed toward a community of like-minded scholars and I mean like-minded in the sense of people who specialize in in the same areas and becomes more a matter of doing something that that looks from one angle more like public education but it also feels like a public hectoring and then there's this tendency um, to um, 
to proclaim the work that, just to put it crudely and to fast, fast forward a bit, the work that would get you into the guest chair on MSNBC or even into the host chair if you're good enough or if you're lucky enough as being the equivalent of the scholarly work. Uh, and so, I mean, that's kind of where we are now. Today we're going to talk about race, conscious womanism. Okay, so that's the first thing. You know, I, I wanted to show, so it's not just, that, you know, you got black male scholars or people who do black male studies that are talking about intersectionality is really actually driven by economic interest and the justification for their presence in the universities and their advancement into positions of prominence, uh, you know, on talk shows and shit like, you know, public, the new public intellectuals who are kind of like going to set society straight. Uh, you know, that's kind of what it's become. Uh, but anyway, you know, here's Curry, man, and here's what he has to say about it. Uh, and then I'm going to open up the floodgates, and, or if not, I'm about to bounce out. And the black feminist economic endeavor. Let's do it. All right, so last week I started, I left off with, I guess, uh, a somewhat controversial thesis, um, namely that black feminism uses a race-sex identity uh, to partner with white women for political and economic power. And I argue that what this, in fact, does is it allows... Man, so, so he already said it. He says, black feminism basically utilizes the categories of race, class, and gender to align itself with the second most powerful group in the country. That's what he says. So, you know, he says there's an economic driving force behind it. Let Curry speak, though. I them to use gender oppression to hide their economic motivations uh, behind align, aligning themselves with the second most powerful racial group in America. Now, I want to explain something. This is not only a political ideology, but this is also driven by a demographic change in the university. Right now, black women get two-thirds of the PhDs that's awarded to black people. So even though this is a type of discursive idea that comes about in disciplines like women's studies or black feminism, it's also driven by this demographic fact that you have black women now competing for jobs against black other black men and uh, other white women on these types of issues. Now, there's an obvious reality here uh, that black men, black children are subject to the same types of abuses that black women are subject to. That's very important for people to understand. Okay? Now, like, again, one could argue, like, if intersectionality is an outwardly uh, based theoretical apparatus to, you know, kind of condemn corporations for not treating black women fairly or any other kind of women with intersectional identities fairly, okay, cool. Whatever the case may be, I mean, it's still questionable because then the question becomes, well, what about other demographics? But what it does is it, it takes a step further and it turns inward. Right, it turns inward, and then it starts talking about people in the black community itself. But then what it goes on to do is it makes black men boogeymen and says that they're violent and that they're you know basically oppressing and dominating the community itself. And you see a lot of people you know mimic and 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 ape this talking point. You know what I mean? But and tomorrow, one of the things I'm going to do is to demonstrate that a lot of black men in the manosphere. You're doing the exact same goddamn thing. You're making a similar arguments that, that, that a lot of these chicks are making, black feminists are making. But and I'll show I'll show you exactly how tomorrow. I'm not gonna get into the shit tonight, but a lot of you motherfuckers are making the exact same kind of arguments as these. I, I, I this is this is not supposed to be the form which why you know I get nasty and, and start being vulgar because. It's, you know, the Black Manosphere show of the week. So I'm going to try to refrain from using too much vulgarity and uh, using too many uh, obscene epithets. But, you know, in general, what, what I want to say is some of y'all sound like these chicks, man. Real talk. <laughs> but at any rate, getting back to Curry, man. So even though black feminism tries to make an exclusive claim to the types of sexual and gender abuses that happen, things like rape, especially prison rape, I've mentioned before, child abuse, poverty, these are all things that happen to the black community based on this. So he's saying sexual abuse, especially if you start talking about prison rape, early sexual debut, sexual vulnerability, sexual violation by people in, you know, 
police positions, uh, sexual assault by, or made to penetrate sexual assault by women, domestic violence, all of this shit, black men also experience these phenomena. But what intersectionality does is, especially if you, you start talking about the second paper that Kimberly Crenshaw wrote, Mapping the Margins, she turns away from talking about interracial domination and oppression, and it starts talking about intraracial domination and oppression, and it makes black men, and these, you know, I'm not saying I'm exactly uh, quoting Tommy Curry here, but it turns black men into boogeymen. And it puts all of the pathology and the dysfunction on black men. And it absolves them of any culpability or responsibility for what they also do. And instead of looking at the root of the problem, it roots everything, it undergirds everything in the language of male dominance. And you know, and he, you know, basically he's saying like, this is some bullshit. And a lot of these chicks are doing this because it pays to do this shit. Like you get paid, you get a check for doing this shit. You get the bag for throwing black men under the bus and saying they the dirtiest thing in sight. And you know, they're throwing stones as well though, but they're hiding their hands and shit at the same time. Anyway, let me, let me get back to it. The sexuality in a white supremacist society. Now what black feminism tries to do is it takes us, given that the patriarchal culture that we see in a larger Eurocentric society or white society and the power of white society also translates into the power that black men have over them. So it's the domination of black women uh, by black men. So this is where the idea I've mentioned before that black male privilege gains its ground in the academy. But this is nothing more than a kind of mythology because what happens here is that this is not sociologically proven. It's not, the, it's not like we're holding sociological and economic uh, you know, conferences or writing papers. Today, there's no peer-reviewed paper uh, on black male privilege that actually shows how it benefits black men on the long run. So then this ideology itself gains footing because what you have is an economic motivation, black women with PhDs trying to fight for limited academic and disciplinary spaces against black male academicians. So there's an economic driving force where black men now become the primary economic competitors in academic spaces with black feminists. So as we know from Reconstruction to now, there's a type of racial scapegoating that goes on that's pushed forward by an economic motivation that aligns with the ideological uh, stereotypes that black people have, or black women, or black feminists in this case have, of other black men. <clears throat> so what we have to think about then is how these economic motivations behind this ideology of black feminism is not only pushing the types of things they put out, but also the analysis they give us of the black community. So that's why I end with that. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I've exhausted for the most part what it is that I want to say with this, man. Like, there's an economic driving force behind the ideology uh, about you being typecast as a boogeyman. And principally, I don't have a problem with people, you know, talking about the problems inherent in the black community or speaking out, or, you know, having comments to say about the shit that black men are doing is inappropriate. But like, if only black men are doing shit that's inappropriate, come on, man. Like, that's like, we, we got, we have verifiable empirical evidence, man, that demonstrates that black men are being subjected to the same bullshit as women. But nobody actually gives a fuck. So again, I got all these, you know, people be, uh, becoming members, not at the same time, but you know, this is. But shout out to Mr. Heat, man. Big up to him, man. Let me let me give shout outs, man, right now while all this is going. On. Shout out to him, man. What's up, man? What's good, Ryan? What's cracking with you, bro? <laughs> what's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? The man professor is in the, his eyes. He's in the building, baby, baby. What's cracking with you, man? <laughs> He says, I'm if you know, well, you know. Man. Shout out to him, man. Shout out to him. What's man. up? Shout what's up? Man. I'm just giving, you know, I'm doing the housekeeping before I uh, let you speak, man. Let me. Go ahead. Uh, Mike Johnson says, thank you, Gigi, for your work. Thanks for the topic. Appreciate that, my brother. And Electrician480 says, great topic, Gigi. Salute to you, bro. Shout out to you, man. Appreciate that, bro. For real, man. Shout out to all y'all, man. And this is, you know, all of this I did at the last minute, man. The brother Black in effect, man, he, you know, he issued the call, man. He's like, man, I'm kind of panicking here. I don't have a Black manager for sure of the week. 
could you please, uh, you know, anybody please step up and fill in this slot? So I did it. I, I've been thinking about doing it, but I never, you know, I didn't really put all the, the uh, pieces of the puzzle together like I wanted to as seamlessly as I wanted to. But I think the argument is clear uh, that, you know, a lot of what drives this theory is the substantiation or the apology for their presence in these institutions. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and while it's being done, it's one thing to argue that you, you, you deserve a presence there predicated upon what the society at large is doing. But it's another thing to throw black men on the, uh, you know, under the bus and say, well, your presence needs to be there. And if, if not, then, you know, you're going to be raped and, and pillaged and, and, and abused by these black Negro savages. Now, that's a problem, man. <laughs> but man, professor, man, speak up, bro. Holler, What's going man. on, man? Listen, listen. I don't know if you guys have ever heard uh, Kimberly Crenshaw talk, uh, whether on a uh, uh, at a conference or whatever that's recorded. You might see it somewhere on YouTube. I would suggest you guys might look her up. She's a very articulate person. Um, she's very good with words. Um, and as Gigi was saying about the postmodern people, uh, and this is what and Gigi was saying, um, what Noam Chomsky says and what uh, Camilla Paglia says, it's all about mumbo jumbo. It's just mumbo jumbo. And when you hear these people talk, when you, when you read what they write, you have to pay attention to the mumbo jumbo. Because on the surface, that, that whole concept, it sounds like a very sophisticated um, notion and what have you. It's a, you know, like a thousand dollar term. <laughs> um, but in actuality, man, it's, it's an anti-radical p- politics. You know, you have to ask yourself the question. Um, and, and I'm glad you had uh, you, you did, you know, your exposition of, of Adolf Reed, man. Um, it, it, it goes against any type of uh critique, and I would say Marxist critique of society. You know, that nothing about this really, you know, her, that initial article in 89 and what have you, um, she's dealing with, and this is one of the critiques of what she wrote back at that particular time, because she was pulling from a legal case from 1977, I believe. And um, and she has no, she does no analysis whatsoever of, of labor uh, and the problems of labor that was happening you know, at that particular time. Um, and this is before we enter into, you know, kind of full-blown post-industrialism in the 1980s. You know what I mean? I mean, so, um, you know, she's writing about how uh, a particular um, uh, industry um, hires or hired a black man and hired a white woman. Um, but the same industry, you know, once you get to the 80s is outsourcing. <laughs> you right, know what right, I'm saying? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so that's that's the that's one of the problems there, you know. And the other part of it is that the kind of larger context, man, of the 1980s and kind of the rise of the new black middle class, man. You know what I mean? So, so much of it is tied to, you know, uh, the, the 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 class aspirations of black women, uh, in particular. But the larger kind of class aspirations of middle class blacks, you know, that were were happening, you know, at that time. So it's no it's no accident that, you know, that type of idea, um, you know, emerged at that time. Man, we're talking about the Reagan era and everything was happening under Reagan, and then you go into the '90s with the Clintons, you know, Bill Clinton rather, and the the, the other shifts in the economy and what have you, man. And, and and what we have, man, is just a, 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 a different expression of anti-radicalism that pretends to be radical, you know? I, I, mean, I mean, the whole concept, and, and I, I've been thinking about this a lot well, for, for a long time, actually, but in more recent times, because I'm wrapping this book up um, with citations and stuff, that word, man, is thrown around so much. It is thrown around so much like it's, a, like it's an amulet, like it's a source of, <laughs> like it's a, it like it's a, like it's like like it's a, a a source of magic that if we it just is. if we it just is. take if we just take this magic dust right, um, <laughs> called intersectionality, that it's going to you know uh, transport us into into some type of a new American utopia, 
Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. And, and right. that's and that's the most ridiculous part of it. When in actuality, you're just talking about the further incorporation of of, of black women uh, into into white capital. You know what and, I mean? And th- and that's the that's the damning part of it all. See, it, it presents itself as radical, but the whole movement towards diversity in and of itself is an anti-radical movement. It really actually, like they say race, class, and gender, but there's no real talking about class anymore. And, and, and they, they do talk about class, but when they talk about it, they only talk about it in terms of abuse. Uh, yeah. They really don't talk about it in terms of trying to move forward with you know a, a kind of social and economic political movement that would you know be fair for all Americans. And this is what like you know people like Adolph Reed would come in and say, yeah. well, you know, like this shit is milk toast. To be to be perfectly honest, like I mean, you know, we we begin to talk about diversity so much, but think about it. What does diversity actually signify? For the vast majority of the population, like especially the the, ma- the masses of black folks, it's really tokenism. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, like I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to be ignorant, you know, like I mean, I get, I wouldn't put it this way. You can't be a house nigga acting like you the most radically charged motherfucker in the building, bro. Yeah. <laughs> but this is what they doing, man. I mean, you know, like I, I. I it's it's milk toast activism, man. It, it, it masquerades as radical, but it's the least radical thing because ba- basically what it relies on is corporate back patronage, man. Yeah, that that's a fact. And, and and I could tell you, you know, we had earnings uh, meeting at my job two weeks ago, and of course, like I said, the CEO is a woman, white woman, seventy two years old. And what did she say towards the end? This is you know diversity and inclusion for who? Women and LGBT. Mm-hmm. Best, she specified that. <laughs> but see, I, I'm and, telling and you. this is and this is why Curry, this this is why Curry's work is important to me, uh, and and the work that like Dr. Ron O'Neill is doing and Dr. Tia San Johnson is doing. I, I can't. I'm not gonna put myself in the category just yet. But but here's the point, right? These guys have already figured out. Like, okay, look. You're doing, I understand you want to be included. You want to get your bag. You you want to have a position. You want to, I mean, everybody wants to be acknowledged and recognized and perceived as valuable. But you can't actually be part of a justice-based movement that throws like a certain segment of the black population under the bus in order for you to get that, to, to be acknowledged, to be respected. You got to tell the truth about what's happening in the black community, but it's not happening. Okay, what we what we're getting is what what makes white women comfortable. Yeah, uh, it, we have the axiology uh, and the diversity of white women, and they get to pick and choose in a paternalistic fashion what they consider to be acceptable interpolation into their bodies, or social bodies. Okay, yeah. but we've always known. Let's just face this shit, man. Like we are, we've always known that black women have been more amenable to the white household or to white institutional structures than black men have ever been. Right. I mean, this is just we know this. Like, there's empirical and archival evidence that demonstrates that black women are not perceived as threats. Uh, you know, black white men feel like okay, maybe they can get sexual favors from these women at any moment. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like uh, uh, white women used to use black women to you know as an extended part of their families. You know, as yeah. wet nurses and fucking nannies. Yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, and 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 this is where you know um, someone like Orlando Patterson, uh, you know, comes in. You know, when he did his book on. Um, on, on slavery or rituals of blood, which came out in, in 98. And he had a subsequent article that was the prelude to the book that came out in 1994 um, that dealt with this whole, with, with, with the gender thing. And, you know, and basically he just said, you listen, you know, black women have always had greater proximity uh, to the white ruling class than black men. And that white people have you know always been comfortable, you know what I mean? And working in, in their homes and what have you. Uh, and so there's a certain type of legibility, you know, that um, that black women have in relationship to white society, dominant white society in particular, 
that black men simply do not have. You know what I mean? And so um, we are only plausible. Black people are only plausible to the degree that, you know, black women represent who black people are. You know what I'm saying? Correct. And um, and and that's what um, compromises us right now, so especially with the movements and with these female activists and all that kind of stuff. White people are programmed; their condition and racism um, drives it all to only to only um, see black women. You understand? And, yeah. uh, and, and and black women and black women know that you know what I mean. And these women, Kimber Crenshaw and all those, they all they all know that they 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 would deny it. They would never acknowledge it in, in writing or anything like that. But it's it's just that's just the fact of the, of the matter, you know. Um, right. Yeah. And so this is not. And my problem is that here's the big the big problem is that you want to tell me that this bourgeois politics is not bourgeois politics. You know, and, and, and that's the, that's the fundamental problem. And they're teaching young women this, you know, in colleges and universities, and and these, and they just think that they got some radical politics. And this, I'm like, this is anti. This is not radical. This is anti-radical. This is this is status quo. It's yeah. plantation politics, bro. Is what it is. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, but you can't say anything at the current moment because then you'll get everybody in the academy all into a tizzy. You'll get the corporations into a tizzy. You'll get, the, you know, uh, the government into a tizzy. All of this. White men premeditated this shit, bro. I, 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 look, I, I've already, I think, as far as I'm concerned, without a shadow of a doubt, I've demonstrated the white men or the orchestrators are all of this. Like, to me, they are the inventors of contemporary woke politics, although they are also deny that they are part of this. Like, I mean, like, think about it. Who was the guy that initially introduced sex into the Civil Rights Bill of 64? It was Howard Smith, the Democrat Damn. from Virginia. <laughs> and think I mean, about this. Think about this. The, the transgenders used intersectionality. You know what I'm saying? That's what the oh, transgenders yeah. are now. The, 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 the people who were born as white males in particular. <laughs> yeah, born yeah. as white males. It's no accident. It's no accident that everybody in dominant media and politics is talking about transgenderism. Yeah. Because because who, who at, at the end of the day, who are we talking about, man? White men. About? <laughs> <laughs> they get to become women. They get to do whatever the fuck they want. How, they look. This this is what fucks me up about it, right? And if bro, like I remember it like yesterday. Okay, this is how I met Dr. Tia Sign Johnson. Now you, I'm gonna tell you why I met you. I met you in St. Louis, bro. St. Louis, I remember. I remember you. As, I met you because I came to see Curry down there. Yeah. But it was, I think, uh, who was speaking at the time? Uh, Lewis Gordon, I think, was speaking. Lewis Gordon, huh? At the Caribbean, uh, uh, phil what's the, what's the, what's the organization called? Association. Uh, the Caribbean Association. Philosophical Association. Right, that's yeah. what it was. We were in downtown St. Louis. Yep, and I was yep. like, man, you know, because I didn't know you at the time. I'm like, okay, well, like, yep. all right, well, who are these motherfuckers? You know what I'm saying? But then I heard you speak. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's a motherfucking nigga right there. <laughs> not, not in a negative way, you know what I'm saying? But I, you, know, you, I know, I know. So I'm like, oh, okay, okay, okay. So I, I'm glad that, but the funny thing is, so, so I'm on fucking the internet, like on Facebook and shit. Now I hadn't, I didn't know Dr. Johnson at the time, but I'm on, I'm on the internet. I made a post on Facebook and it was to this effect. I said, okay, so Serena Williams is an ugly man, but Caitlyn Jenner is a beautiful woman. I'm like, what the fuck is that shit? And I put, the, I put it out there just like that. I said, huh? And so then comes, because there's a there's a, a a philosopher, not 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 peek this shit out, right? I'm not gonna say the motherfucker's name. Now, they they're known because they were a person, they this person is a person who's in, you know participated in women's sports and won awards, you know, shit like that. Okay, I ain't gonna say no names because I, I just I'm not doing this shit right now. But at the mm -hmm. end of the day, this motherfucker is part of the young black philosophers like society and shit. Like, damn, damn. 
No, no disrespect, but I'm like, okay, well, who the fuck let her? She ain't black. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, you yeah. know, no, no disrespect. I mean, you know, I'm yeah. not trying to say that this person is not a human being and none of that. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. But I am saying, what the fuck is they? What the fuck are they doing in the society of young black philosophers, man? But anyway, so I put the post out. This motherfucker started going at me like I'm a trans misogynist. Uh, you're transphobic and all of this kind of shit. And, you know, the motherfucker started telling me I got black male privilege. I'm like, pump the fucking brakes. Mm -hmm. Hold on, man. First mm -hmm. and foremost, man, look, I done been to prison. Mm -hmm. I done had, I done, I've been parental alienated in terms of, like, being able to see my kids and shit. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I done been fucking shot at, all kind of crazy shit. Like, all of the shit that I've experienced in the world from where I'm from. You got the nerve, your white ass, yeah. who yeah. able to participate in fucking female mm -hmm. sports and to go matriculate through college and to change the sex. You got the nerve to call me privileged? Mm -hmm. You got the nerve to say that I'm privileged and you're not? I'm like, man, if you don't shut the fuck up with that bullshit, and that's when Curry was like, you know, they start talking to me in the back chat. Like, hold on, wait a minute. No, hey, man, look, see, 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 you know, like, like look. And they, you know, just giving me info and shit. And, you know, that's when I, I, I uh, you know, I, I was introduced to Dr. Tia Sanjay. Giant. This shit had to be about fucking 12 years ago or something like that. But the whole point is, these people get to be whatever they want, however they want. And we got to still fucking take, like, the, 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 uh, the burden. These people are the inventors and the authors of colonialism and shadow slavery. It is a demographic. Both of them together, white women and men. Now they get to play this game like they're fucking subjected to injustice themselves and like diversity consists or in here's and them having all the weirdos in their own demographic be, you know, inter, you know, interpolated into the, you know, the visible, you know, hierarchy or whatever the case may be. And the whole point is, since when have they not been fucking integrated into the hierarchy? Yeah, 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 and, and that's the thing that they wanna, they want us to believe that they are honorary black people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and they would take and here's the, and this the, the, the insidious thing about it, they would take something like intersectionality, which they do, and weaponize it against us. You know, Man. and uh, and and that's the that's the that's the the the, the major problem. So if you got a a white trans person, a trans woman. Who is using this nomenclature of intersectionality and they insert themselves into you know all this stuff black female thinking and everything like that and then they start d dipping and dabbling in our history and start saying that you know they are just as stigmatized as we are and all that kind of stuff then that that's just you know <laughs> bro that that just does some bizarre things you know to all of us so it's it's a it's a it's a major as you said it's a major colonial it's a major colonial move, man. You know? and, and, but, but the, the <coughs> fucked up thing <laughs> is, is that you got so many black men who are, who are fucking utilizing this as a means to you know exhibit their own virtue and to show that they're on the right side of justice. Like, I mean, you know, like this shit is to me, it's anathema, man. I, I fucking loathe the quizlings that, that, that do the work of white women, man. Because to me, this is white women's work, bro. But um, it's also white men's work because they are the ones who ushered all of this shit in. They're the ones who started all of this. And they did it because they already knew. They were like, okay, look. If we're going to give niggers rights, then guess what? We're going to make sure our women get them first. There you go. Bottom line. They're like, if there's jobs or something like that and black women going to get them, fuck that. <laughs> they're going to go from being our nannies to our equals? Yeah. Fuck that. No. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, now they're not working in the homes of white women anymore. So guess what ends up happening? Now you get washing machines, motherfucking microwaves. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, everything becomes vacuum cleaners and shit like this. Now everything is more convenient for home life now. That you don't need the, the black nanny worker, the domestic worker in the house anymore. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, and so, it, it, it's just they, they, it ain't no strange secret, man. The biggest beneficiaries of affirmative action and of the 1964 Civil Rights Act are white women. And now, 
white men if they decide to be women. Yep. And yeah. it's some it's the it's the it's the weirdest shit in the world. But hold on, before I let y'all speak, shout out to Ray Nose, man. Big up to him, man. Appreciate the. Uh, he says uh, GG is straight with no chases. Shout out to him. Shout out to Charles Gilmore, man. Big up to you, bro. Appreciate that. Big up, man. Shout out to uh, Passport OG. I know you've been trying to become a member for a minute. Big up to you. Shout out to the, uh, the Roger Report Live, man. Big up to that brother, man. Shout out to Aaron Peters, man. Big up to you, brother. Big up, man. And somewhere in there, you know, I got Mr. Heat. I can't find out where he is, though. For some reason, he, you know, where, where, where he uh, put the put the cash. There he is. Shout out to Mr. Heat, man. Big up to him, man. Big up to you, bro. So, you know, like, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, man, there's a lot of weird shit going on, bro. You know, like, I, look, and I don't be, begrudge anybody from trying to get the bag. But don't try to throw me under the bus when you're trying to get the bag, man. That's the only thing I'm saying. Go get your bag or whatever, but don't try to throw me under the bus while you're trying to do that shit. Don't try to make it seem like we're boogeymen and regressive and, you know, like the biggest victims of the racial horror of colonialism, slavery, all that. We're the biggest victims of all of this shit, you know, next to the fucking Native Americans who were basically subjected to genocide and erasure. Mm -hmm. And then now all of a sudden, you know, we got to pretend like, and then it's black men also co-signing this shit. We got to pretend like we're the biggest problem. Yeah. Like we're just inherently fucking sexist, even though we have the same, like in terms of when you do, you know, studies, personality profiles and psychometrics, we, we have pretty much the same attitudes as black women. Like, like statistically, you know, insignificant. When it comes to being progressive in, in terms of, you know, should women be able to hold positions in offices and have the ability to hold jobs and to matriculate through school and black men are at the, like, the top of the curve as it pertains to like equity and inclusiveness for real. Even see, more so than white women and, and, and black, and, excuse me, white women and white men. But still we get castigated and looked upon like we are the fucking bottom, like in terms of our ideology and our, our political understanding and progressiveness. Like we get typecast is that we are like, you got women right now saying that we out here murdering them and shit in mass. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it, yeah. It, it's so it's like, if you invoke a go back to DW Griffith's birth of a nation, man, you know, 1915 and you know, um, you know, it was a it was based off a novel by a, a white preacher in North Carolina named Thomas Dixon. You know, they were, they were protesting against what happened during Reconstruction. You know what I mean? And, and basically saying that, you know, we don't we don't need to see another era where black men ascend to power. You know, in the Southern states as, as legislatures, legislators rather, and everything, because these men cannot govern. Because they, you know, they're hypersexual, uh, they're violent, they're lazy, they're shiftless, you know, they're savages. You know what I mean? And and the reality is, is that, you know, under feminism, um, that has just simply updated it. it. They updated all that stuff, man, after the 1970s. You know, and, and black women have ran with it. And I've said this to to feminists um, who I know and have had work with, and I say, you know, you all, you all see us as savages. Y'all see us as savages and you all think that we need to be civilized. And for you, civilization means that to be, you know, uh, subject to your understanding of, of education, which is colonial. Uh, and if that does not work, then we need to be locked up. We need to be contained. If containment doesn't work, then we need to be exterminated. You understand? Because everything that they write about us justifies our deaths. Everything. Everything that they've written about us, okay, can be used. You can, if we were to, to resurrect the, the 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 third right as it was, you know, World War Two, it could be used to just completely decimate the whole black male population, just based upon the stuff that they've said about us over the last fifty years. Man, that's how deep this thing is, man. You know, 
and, 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 and they don't want to they don't want to acknowledge that they don't want to acknowledge that, that and that's why you know white society the, the liberals and what have you you know uh, that, that's why they are so useful to them you know what i mean because you know all you got to do once you put the ten, all the attention on us then there's no attention on white society and its impact on us you know what i mean and uh and and, and that's the man when you talk about treachery and betrayal and all of that man it is just off the charts and i i can't think of any other group and i know in other parts of the world you know like in african african countries they have civil wars and stuff like that and everything and they have problems between elites and non-elites but I, i have not i have yet to come across anything like this where you have one element within a group that would virtually create an ideology that could potentially lead to the extinction, to the not just the extinction, but the extermination of the other side of the group. That produces out of their wounds the other half of the group. Yeah. <laughs> That's the craziest shit about it. Like, you know, like I, I, I could never understand the sentiment of saying that like the male children that spawn from your wounds are fucking corrupt. Because white women said that they are. Like, what the fuck type of stupidity? Like, what type of enchantment is this shit? So it is. It's like being enthralled, like you said it is. Like, how does that happen, man? Shout out, man. Look. Hit the cash app up, man. Hit the cash app up, man. Help help GG get some Popeyes or something. God damn. You know what I'm saying? But, I mean, at the end of the day, shout out to uh, Beretta. He says, uh, thanks for this many people in this face live catering to devils and love to reiterate the lie of racism doesn't exist this doesn't change their thinking about you yeah for sure man real talk shout out to him man spain man say he got the he got the dr neil tax for you bro. <laughs> but 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 you know i just Man, I, I you know I don't fucking get it, bro. But I, you know, there's some people who haven't said anything, man. So I'm gonna let them have an opportunity to say something, man. Y'all, y'all take over the conversation to a certain extent. Uh, Mr. Zn, equalizer here, big care of her, big, that 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 damn officer, that nigga, that officer of the law. <laughs> hey, what's up, Charles? Hey, you hey, 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 gonna stay at Dr. Green Gorilla? If you it, it, it's okay limit. if I read an excerpt right quick. Go oh, ahead. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So this excerpt, this is from a book called Color Communism and Common Sense. It was written in 1958 by a brother called Manning Johnson. Uh, This brother had basically um, started from the bottom of the American Communist Party and worked his way up, like all the way up to the top. And basically what happened is that, um, to give you some backstory, the reason why he wrote this book is because as he rose up the ranks and saw them for what they were, he kind of came, became dis dissolution with uh, communist and Marxist ideology. Um, Just to give a point of what you guys are talking about, this is what he wrote in his book. He said, see here, he said, betrayal of the Negro people may well come through the communist corruption of the Negro intellectual. This is not so difficult since the communists, the quote unquote white liberals and the quote unquote white progressives do the thinking for most of them. The utter bankruptcy of the Negro intelligentsia is starkly evident by the reason of absence of any strong or dramatic movement for genuine Negro organization, leadership, and thinking. Deep in the swamp of inferiority, lack of ability, muddled thought, the Negro intelligentsia looks to the phony white liberals, politicians, and progressive hypocrites for leadership, guidance, and money. These quote-unquote whites are creators of isms other than Americanism, which spreads like an epidemic in the ranks of the hapless Negro intellectuals. Due to the lack of race pride, there is no immunity. So, what he was basically saying in that excerpt is that the reason why you see them repeating a lot of these like intersectional uh, feminist talking points, a lot of this anti-black misandry and, and promoting the narrative that we're, you know, misogynists and need to be a uh, quote unquote reform. It's not because they're um, genuinely thinking for themselves. It's because they don't think for themselves. You know, um, you see this with, um, with the guys, I guess you think where I talk about the quote unquote black trans struggle and stuff like that. It's like, if you notice every idiotic, narrative that white far left has come up with so-called bread tube and other so-called black people on the far left they just take it and just put a quote-unquote black face on it you know the white, white they chocolate talk about dip it. Toxic, exactly white feminists talk about 
toxic masculinity, they talk about toxic black masculinity. You know what I mean? And it doesn't matter how idiotic, how ahistorical, how pseudo intellectual it is, they will still say it because again, it's they can be intellectual cowards while simultaneously claiming moral supremacy. So that's the reason why they cling to these like extremist narratives so deeply. You know, it gives them a false sense of moral supremacy whilst not actually having to do anything um, practical uh, to be able to overcome our position in reality. Um, like I was then, telling other people like Mr. Z, I'm like, mm -hmm. if you read up any literature for yourself, okay, you would know that the idea that the so-called uh, black men in America need, is a quote-unquote inherent misogynist that needs to be reformed is complete and utter bullshit. And in fact, yeah. Most of these um, negative attributes that they try to say are uh, uh, exclusive to so-called black men, they're either A, projecting their own character flaws and dysfunctions onto us, or B, they're taking the ideas that we've come up with, the good ideas, and have either upscaled it, culturally appropriated it, or corrupted and bastardized it by taking it to an, to an uh, unhealthy extreme including the idea of communism itself. Big so. Kev, let me, let, me, let me squeeze in right here, right here because I have, to, I have to drop in a minute. Um, so shout out to Green Gorilla for giving me the, the terminology that I was looking for with standpoint epistemology. So going to what Big Kev was talking about, about the, the moral supremacy and the moral high ground. So that's what I kept on calling it, right? When you look at what black women are claiming with um, being black plus women and that give them a certain viewpoint and a certain morality because they're so oppressed because they're both black and women and if, if you add in some of their sexuality then let's say black and women and same-sex loving then that gives them a certain um moral supremacy because or moral high ground because of that so now that i know that what that's called um in academic speak is um standpoint epistemology so exactly in and I'm, I'm actually pretty glad that you gave me that language because that's what i was looking for this whole time so you know there's there's that but you know also to adolf reed the 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 fact that we went from a real critique of white supremacy um and white hegemonic power to these people turning inward and then deciding that the boogeyman is the black man, right? While simultaneously, and I'm, I'm just gonna go right there with it, while simultaneously low level um, critiquing white men, but not really actually really wanting to be white, 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 white men, that part, um, it, it, it turns black men into the boogeyman, but it, it, it puts them in this awkward position where you're, you're stepping down and crushing down the the male counterpart, your male counterparts, right? And this is why I would argue why you see so many academically accomplished black women single as a loose leaf paper. That's why you see so many, because they literally take the legs from under their future husbands and boyfriends and baby daddies, right? And then turn around and then complain about it afterward when no one else is trying to, you know, take them off the market. And that does well, some something of, you well, were some saying. Of, well, some of them do, Mr. Well, put it this way. I, I got a frat brother, man. His, you know, his wife is a, a PhD. You know what I'm saying? And you know, uh, he's a frat brother of mine. You know, and uh, you know, she doesn't humiliate him. You know, none of that shit. You know what I'm saying? She, but she makes more money than he does, but she doesn't humiliate him. You know what I'm saying? Or, or try to. Not every black woman that has a PhD is a feminist. Okay, and and on this hardcore radical lesbian bullshit. You know, like I, my cousin. Got a PhD. I had mine before she got hers, but you know I kind of mm -hmm. encourage her to get a shit. You know what I'm saying? I mean, not to say she don't have her own issues and her problems or whatever the case may be, uh, but mm -hmm. you know, like not all black women are like this, but a lot of them have been seduced by this shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I mean, agree. let's just face it. A lot of them have been seduced by the positionality that they have because they're able to triangulate white supremacy in a way that we we cannot. Okay, we are the pen ultimate. We are yeah. the nadir. Okay, like we're at the bottom of the barrel. It just is is what it is. Categorically, we occupy the bottom position. Okay, in terms of our cultural uh, expression, and in terms of our innate capacity, in terms of you know our virtue. I mean, that's why I don't like for black men to do the same shit that these women are doing. 
Okay. Yeah, I'm but actually any, looking forward to your show tomorrow because I, if you say what you, I think I know what angle you're going to go to, and yeah, I'm looking forward to that tomorrow. Well, well I mean, you know, the whole point is, look, I, in in short, all I'm saying is, don't throw other black men under the bus in order to big yourself up, because what you, I mean, you're not you're not actually gaining any accept you know acceptance in that manner, and you make it easier for us to be exterminated and to stay in the same to stay in the same position that we're in. And then it creates fractionalization, balkanization to the point where we can't ever get our shit together. Green yeah, could I say, I say this real quick? Because I have to drop real quick. Let me say, I'm, I'm sorry for cutting you off. Um, last thing I want to say, um, don't lose your train of thought. Don't lose your train of thought. Oh, it's gone. Let me, let me see if I can keep going. I'm sorry, but if I, if I can't, no, I'll, no, I'll try to hurry yeah. up because... Yeah. But Colonel, man, you say something, man, until he get, you get his... Uh... Yeah, yeah. God damn it. I was trying to lose it. I was trying not to lose it. Go ahead. Whoa! And... Um... Everything you said has been squared point on. There um, go, Charles. Sorry. Sorry. I got it. Um, the last but, thing I want to say, I'm sorry, Charles. <laughs> but no, the last thing I want to say is something you were saying, Green Gorilla, about, you know, if you got, you know, not if you got problems with women, I feel bad for you, son. Um, so, you know, what I would argue um, that we have also is is scorn, hurt, and I call it um, little girls and grown women's bodies that enter into academia still holding on to um, childhood rejection or feeling ignored as children, and that informs them in their academic accomplishments, right? So when these people graduate college and when they when they get up to the highest heights, whether it's politics, whether it's entertainment, there's a tinge of like black misandry, and it's really more than a tinge of black misandry. So a lot of these people are being informed by being socially awkward, by feeling unattractive, by whatever skin tone they have. And it does affect the way they see black men and the way they speak about black men in the presence of non-black people. That's how you then have what you were saying. That's how you then have this um, trans non-black person telling you about black male privilege because I guarantee you that person was being informed by Probably one of these type of black women. Yeah, so man, look, they got you know? shit called sister circles and shit, man. They yeah. go around, they, 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 bro. I done seen it with my own fucking eyes, man. I done heard them talk about it and the whole nine. Like, it, look, principally, I don't have a problem with it, but you know, like the whole idea that you could just, you know, form a circle, get around, pass the bottle of champagne and shit, have a stick or some shit like that, and talk about <laughs> how niggas ain't shit. Come on, bro. Like, I mean, like, really, essentially, that's where we going with this, man? Like, 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 look, I get that niggas ain't shit to y'all to some degree. I mean, I know niggas break your hearts or whatever the case may be. Yeah. And vice versa. It ain't it ain't like it's just a one-way street. It's a two-way street, you know what I'm saying? This, this whole, you know, love and war shit, you know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, man, the only thing I've ever said is, look, bro, both men and women had the capacity to exhibit virtue or vice. That goes for black men and black women, okay? And both black men and black women have the capacity to either be coons or to be progressive in terms of black politics, okay? It, it, it is what it is. Now, to argue that only men can be coons and be regressive and to hold black folks back and, look, what I, what I know is this, and I think what, what, what Ron O'Neill was trying to articulate is this, bro. We know that there's a certain proximity to whiteness that you can have by claiming to have an intersectional identity. It makes you, it, it puts you in proximity with whiteness and acceptance. It, put it this way. You have something, there's a philo philosophical concept called the abject, okay? Where, where when you countenance or come into contact with things, there's a certain level of uh, disgust or, you know, like embracement, okay? When it comes to you, you're at the lower rung of, of, of acceptance and you you occupied the position of disgust. And to be associated with you, you troglodytish nigga, is to be associated with disgust. We gotta stop doing that to each other, man. I tell you, I tell you, I tell you, good doctor. You know, <clears throat> I gotta give you a flowers once again, fire stream. Um you see a combination of hypocrisy, educational misinformation, and a finagling of numbers. When I was a young rookie cop, I used to believe in the notion that these guys are beating the hell out of these women 
without no justice, no no context, till you really get the thick of it, and you start noticing why are all the aggressors, or majority of the aggressors of my reports, women. So go go across the notion of women not being violent. It goes across the notion of black men just are these brutish types of people. And and you forget that not only these uh, politicians influence daily life and work, they also influence the criminal justice system against black men. But, you know, nobody cares until it's their son and then maybe. And I always ask this question. I don't care about the men you sleep with, you marry, you date. What about the ones you birth? Are you doing everything to give them a fair shot? Do you look at your sons the same way you look at any other man? And I'm starting to come to the realization that, yes, they do. They don't want their sons to be in an elevated stance to lead their families. They want well, their know. sons to become, you know, servants or subsidiaries of their ideology. And, and yeah, I would say this. I, I would just let me just say this. It, it's it is it is beyond academia, man. I think it's just it, it, the larger thing, man. Is is they have a culture, black female culture, um, uh, which you know what they consume on television, what they what they listen to, um, the sister circles, um, the magazines that cater to them, and all that kind of stuff. You know, you you have ideas. Um, unexamined ideas uh, uh, about us and about their situation that just circulate um on and 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 and that you know that contributes to i'm gonna say this 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 deeply unenlightened perspective on how not just the black situation is but just how the world freaking works you know what i'm saying and uh and there is and what the sad thing is is that this is clear that a degree don't really mean too much when it comes down to uh the ability to think uh and to think deeply and to think introspectively um because you know the, the so-called most educated um they they just lack it at the collective level uh the the the, the, the just to the, I'm not gonna say the ability. They just they, they just lack the the resolve or wherewithal to be able to think complexly and in in very expansive ways about America and Black people's place in it. And 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 it's it's, it's it is it is mind boggling. It is mind boggling that um, you would think that after 50 years of incorporation um, that you would have some type of sophistication <laughs> emerge uh, among this group of people that would uh, fundamentally go against the grain. You know what I mean? And it, it has not happened. And so this is, we're talking about the, the depths of propaganda at every level across society at, at every age group, man. You know, um, and, and again, and Dr. J says this repeatedly is that you know when you when you talk about the impact of feminism you, you, we just can't limit it to the academics you know it's 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 it's, it's beyond them and then you it's compounded with all the lgbtq stuff and, and all the uh uh the ridiculous gender ideology that is circulating all over the place right now and it only heightens you know you know their belief that somehow or another they're not black that they OJ. <laughs> that's, that's what it does. Or they, they Oprah. They're not black. They OJ. If they're not OJ, they Oprah. <laughs> man, it must be a hell of a thing, man, it, you know, to, to feel like you've overcome the stigmatization that's associated with blackness. But there's a certain, so I say the black men are like golems, man. Uh, it's fucked up, bro. Like, you know, like, it's, it's, it's kind of like a ritual where you take all of the negative... We are the scapegoats. You take all of the negativity and all of the pathology and all of the sin 
and you ritualistically offer it up to this demographic. It used there used to be an effigy that you you know you would use and you would put it to the you know to the effigy, but it's actually us. We are the effigy. That's fucked up. But like I you know I don't know how to get around it, man. Like it's like we are the sacrifice. But then they make themselves seem like they're the sacrifice. Like they're sacrificing so much, going so hard for us. But all of this shit is corporate backed, government backed, academic institutional backed racism. Liberal, but it's a liberal variant of it. But it makes itself per- perceive, be perceived as progressive. But actually, what it does is it serves the same kind of function as the Jim Crow South, man. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, that's, and that's the. And that's the cleverness of it all. Yep. Um, and again, um, and I was just listening to Dr. Tommy Curry's work talking about on the um, Black Mountain Studies. I forgot the, I forgot the specific YouTube channel. It's it, it's his most recent lecture. And again, this is why I like laugh when a lot of these like uh, people, you know, in academia, these, these quote unquote black intellectuals, try to talk about this idea of you know we got to repeat repeat defeat quote unquote white supremacy and quote unquote patriarchy. It's like, if you look throughout history, first of all, this idea of female supremacy as this magical cure to all of our problems. First of all, if you understand history, um, such as you know the Negro family in the United States, you will understand that that idea of female supremacy or the woman being put in a p- superior position to you, that is a byproduct of slavery and colonialism. That is not a response to it, that's a byproduct of it, okay? Uh, number two, when it comes to um, this idea of, you know, so-called black men being air quotes patriarchal and that equals oppression, another thing that's hilarious is that if you look at um, the data, I'm like, where's the evidence supporting that theory as well? I mean, where's the evidence saying that as a direct result of, or, or should I say, where's the evidence showing a strong correlation between so-called black men being the primary breadwinners and or final decision makers in their home and an increased uh, rate of domestic violence, child abuse, you know, sexual abuse, et cetera. Um, all the evidence, you know, that we've collected so far shows the exact opposite trend, you know, even when uh, guys like Amiri Brown try to use the idea of, you know, black men gaining the right to vote as quote unquote black male privilege. I'm like, first of all, they advocated for both genders to be able to vote, especially Frederick Douglass and Martin Delaney, number one. And then number two, okay, all these eras that you point to, reconstruction, the building of like Black Wall Street, uh, the civil rights movement, the desegregation of the military, et cetera. These are eras in which so-called Black people made the biggest strides politically and, and economically. So even if you try to poo-poo it, you know, so-called Black men being leaders of their families, I'm like, you're even admitting in your critique of it, that we actually do a better job at making, you know, monumental gains than listening to quote unquote the sisterhood. And that's why I think they don't want to have to confront, you know, because it creates that cognitive dissonance within their own ideology, you know? Yeah. And that's what I was saying that they have a, a fundamentally um, bad calculus, a misunderstanding of reality and how the world works. You know, and, and, you know, that's why the, the protests against patriarchy and all that kind of stuff, is just silly. It's just nonsense. Um, you know, when you understand how societies are are, are, are are structured and what have you and, and operate and how institutions are made and, and laws are created and so on and so forth. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, a, a, a non a, a, a society where you don't have a dominant group of males. I want you to point it to me. I mean, I mean, you can. You, we could talk about Native Americans. We can go to some indigenous group in Australia, somewhere in some remote part of Africa. You know what I'm saying? But but those are those are kind of anomalous in the modern world. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, you know, it, it, the reality is, if you're really serious about patriarchy, you got to destroy every freaking institution in this society. You got to legal institutions, economic institutions, everything. You know. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, what you have is a very childish, childish um, perspective on the world that has been allowed to, to circulate uh, and has been allowed to, to, to circulate without any real pushback or critique or what have you. And 
the white people, they have benefited from it, you know, um, uh, because as long as they can call us these patriarchal boogeymans, again, it takes attention away, away from them. And the other side of it is that, you know, the, the white feminists, you know, they've been very deceptive. They know how society works. You understand what I'm saying? You know, yeah, they, they know say, who runs this shit. They ain't yeah. stupid, man. Like, yeah. one thing yeah. they not about to do is the average white feminist is going to go motherfucking drive her car and go to the suburbs just like all the rest of the white bitches. Sorry. Mm -hmm. It's just the facts, man. Not trying to be ignorant, man. It's just the facts, bro. Look, I have been living in the hood, man, in St. Louis, Northside, man, for a long time. I ain't never seen no shaved head, pink hair, white feminist coming up in that bitch trying to be cool with the motherfucking Negroes that live there. I'm just keeping it a buck. Have you seen it? I ain't nope. seen no trans white motherfuckers up in there trying to, you know, like, okay, what we're going to do is decol decolonize the colonization and your compartmentalization and push, being pushed to the periphery. We're going to, we, we're making steps to create porous boundaries, you know, from one neighborhood to the next. Man, they ain't doing that shit. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm fuck what you're saying in it, your safe space, because the university is a safe space for all kind of fucking freakishness and craziness at the current moment, okay? They found a home there, okay? But the fucking, uh, the, the university system is an extension of the corporate governmental colonial structure, as far as I'm concerned, they're part of it. They're not like, you know, they don't create, like, Charity for real, like and, and and justice for real in the neighborhoods in which they live. You got a lot of universities around, right around hoods, and they gentrify those hoods and displace the populations of persons who live there, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's, no disrespect, man. In St. Louis, Wash U is like that, but I mean, Wash U is in a you know more affluent area, but you know they're close to U City. It's a lot of Negroes that live in U City. They done gentrified all the Negroes around Del Mar. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. uh, St. Louis University. Let's let's just be frank about it, man. That shit is right smack dab in the middle of the fucking hood. They done bought out all of the uh like they used to be places, you know, like where black families used to live, O'Fallon Place and shit like that. They all gone, bro. And and and, and St. Louis, you done bought up the property. No disrespect to the university, but come on, man. Then you got John Hopkins and shit in Baltimore and shit. You know what I'm saying? They right near the hood too. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's like these universities aren't doing their due diligence in dismantling the so-called, you know, their offensiveness. You know what I'm saying? Their garishness where they are, man. They 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 just there, bro. You know, just like and, and they have police forces, campus police and shit that are supposed to be monitoring and protecting the little white, you know, kids, the privileged white kids that come to them. You know what I'm saying? Like, bro, I know what it's like, man, to go across the dividing line. I man, I, I I did a Facebook video about that shit. I'm like, look look at my drive from point A to B. Like what I gotta go through to get to the school. Like uh, in St. Louis, I'm from the north side, man. It's abandoned building, man. Look like Baghdad in that bitch, man. Real talk. Abandoned buildings for miles, man. Like shit decaying for yeah. miles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, okay, now, and then I'm like, okay, I done crossed the magical line. Look at this shit now. Now look at how the neighborhoods look. Look at how the, the businesses, how all of a sudden they improve. This is what I got to see every day as I go to this motherfucker. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But yeah, it's yeah. just, this, this is the way it is, bro. Like, and, and, you know, look, I'm not, I'm not trying to disrespect all these universities, man, but like the, the people who are in them now, like the left, the fake ass motherfuckers in the leftist movements, man, of the '60s, not the the real die hard motherfuckers. Most of them motherfuckers got killed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the fake ass opportunistic motherfuckers from the civil rights movement and the leftist movements, they went, they retreated to the universities, bro. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they and they cashed in. They became tokens, man. And they 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 basically have been agents, not of inclusion, really. But inclusion for themselves and, you know, the establishment and, you know, the edification of themselves. But they haven't really done anything, man, to reach out for the black masses for real. I'm not saying none of them have, you know. But the vast majority, man, come on, man. Let's keep it a buck, man. They drinking cafe lattes, man. You know, and, 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 I, was, and, I, and I would say this, you know, and I, I, Cornel West is one person 
who has spoken about this man, you know, and he's 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 written about it. Um, you know, he put out a book during the Obama era called uh, Black Prophetic Fire. And well, uh, really it, yeah, dealing with the black prophetic tradition. And in very in at the outset of the book, he talks about the co the co optation of uh, of the black middle class and the black elite. You know what I mean? And um uh in in the, the black elite's participation in this whole you know neoliberal order and what have you and it's disc then disconnect you know what i mean he has a there's a you, you guys can go here on youtube and, and and just uh search for um cornell west and chris chris hedges and uh, there's a video called the betrayal of the black elite and they, they have a, a 25 minute conversation about the what he called the betrayal of the black elite and uh, talking about all this stuff, you know what I mean? Even the white man, Chris Hedges, <laughs> he's like, you know, Cornel West, it looks like the black elite is a, is, is a colonial entity within America, you know, and they operate like a colonial force, you know? And, uh, and, and that's just, a, that's, that's, that's the real thing, man. And, you know, and the reality, man, is that you have a lot of people who came out the 60s who are not really activists, you know, who, who went into the university. They were spectators, man. You know, these right, are people, right, right. They were on the, yeah, they were on the sidelines. They watched the civil rights movement, you know, uh, from the, the confines of a living room on TV. Um, and, and they had issues. Uh, 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 Michelle Wallace, you know, she says everything that she got, uh, the material for her book that is attributed to her, you know, you know, was derived from watching TV. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, uh, and, and she ain't the only one. She's not the only one. If you, when you look at the biographies, of a lot of these feminists who were very critical of the Black Panthers and uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, they 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 did not have boots on the ground. They were not activists. They were they were upper middle class, middle class um, children of the Black bourgeoisie, um, you know, who had this you know ultra bourgeois ideology where they took exception to Black male leadership, and, uh, and and I mean, and that's where it stems from, man. You know, and well, Doc, you got to realize, isn't that life itself? You got the fakers and the posers who talk about doing so much or going through so much. Like, for example, in the military, we have something called stolen valor. People wearing medals from <laughs> different different campaigns and shit, and never and never really were there. It's the same thing when you look at. Like I remember, Gigi once told me. He said, once you go to the Ph.D. level, pretty much almost every degree is pretty much philosophy anyway of whatever subject you're taking. And when you look at it, it's there's there's nothing but philosophy when it comes out of books and authors like that. There's no substance. There's no practice. Show us physically where you see this behavior going on in real time. And they fail to do such each and every time. You have the naysayers of the space. Well, the, the black manosphere preaches about hating women. Show us one person involved in the space that talks about hating women. Go ahead. They can't. And, you know, I totally agree with you with that statement. Let me, let me, let me just say this, man, right? Uh, old boy says, does that mean Angela Davis? Now, Angela Davis is a unique case, man. Uh, yep. I think that, you know, uh, Angela Davis ultimately became appropriated, uh, you know, uh, or seduced by the trappings of, of, of the establishment of the university system. You know what I'm saying? And she was kind of lionized and idealized in ways that I think, you know, kind of might have gone too far. But, 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 but the reality is, man, you know, like motherfuckers could say that Angela Davis was like one of them down ass bitches who will go get guns for you. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like she'll put the work in your hands. Cause basically it, a lot of people don't know like why Angela Davis went through what she went through in the first place. So she was arrested in 1970 because of a, she was involved in a hostage situation that took place. Okay. Now there was a dude named Jonathan Jackson and he was like a brother of a cat who was in the black Panther party Okay, George Jackson, uh, who was in prison. So Jonathan Jackson took a judge, a prosecutor's, and three jurors hostage at a courthouse in California. Okay, 
and he wanted to negotiate the release of his brother, George, okay? And other Black Panthers, which he perceived to be political prisoners, okay? Now, this ended up in the death of the judge, of the Jackson himself, Jonathan Jackson, and two of uh, uh, the three hostages, okay? Now, Angela Davis was arrested because she was the one who had the guns registered in her name. So she was also charged with conspiracy and murder and kidnap. Okay. So then she, what she then became was a supporter of, you know, like the escalation of, or the, you know, the, the, the what do they call it? The de dismantling of the prison, you yeah. know, the prison you know, mm -hmm. complex, you know, the mm -hmm. industrial complex. So she went into hiding and eventually she was captured though, you know, in, in New York. And, but she was in 72, she was in prison for two years and she was eventually acquitted for all of the charges. Now I don't, I'm not here to say she was snitching or no shit like that. I have no idea, bro. And, and you know, I'm not trying to get into all that, but she bought the guns that led to that. You know what I'm saying? So one can argue the damn, you know what I'm saying? Like, okay, she has something to do with it. Now, if she was straight up, like, ratting from the beginning, if that's what she was on, they probably wouldn't have arrested her. No way. She probably would have tipped the people off instead of buying them cash the guns to begin with. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, but I think she kind of got co-opted later on. That's just yeah. my opinion, bro. Yeah, and the thing is that there's only one Angela Davis, right? And you, you look at that whole movement, you know, she's a, she stands out. She's not, you, you don't have, when you look at the, the, the people who are the, the faces and names of black feminism or what have you um they don't have those histories man you know these are just regular bourgeois people um you know who who came up you know through a traditional you know a bourgeois family structure and what have you you know what i mean and i'm thinking i'm not going to say their names but they're you know people at spelman college you know and um uh they were spectators you know and so you have a whole lot of these people with nothing but spectators who had a lot to say about events that they never participated in. And they they and they criticize these movements um as spectators. You know what I mean? Now there's nothing wrong, you know, everybody, you know, if you're a historian or you're a cultural critic or a political theorist or whatever, yeah, you do that kind of work. But their critiques of those movements were so strident. You know what I mean? Uh, it, it, you know, it, 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 it comes off as though like, oh, y'all were there. You know what I'm saying? You were actually there. You were actually working in, in the breakfast um, program. Um, you were actually there to see the day-to-day -day stuff that was happening in the Black Panther Party uh, over over their, you know, 10-year period. You know what I mean? You know, you had yeah, someone like, like- That's like Michelle like, Wallace, you know what I'm saying? Like she was like straight in the trenches and, you know. And, on, and that's bro. why you had to have, you had to have people like Elaine Brown um, who never became an academic, you know, who was active, you know, for a long time in the Black Panther Party and, you know, became a politician as a result of her activism, you know, in Oakland. Um, she had to correct a lot of stuff that was being said about Huey P. Newton uh, and, and some of the other men, you know what I mean, that that these other feminists were saying, you know, um, in, 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 you know, subsequent years, you know what I mean? And, uh, and so... Yeah, man, and, and and there are so many others. Um, and I heard, I remember listening to um, Cleve Sellers, Cleveland Sellers out of South Carolina. Cleveland Sellers was a uh, he was a part of SNCC, and uh, and I, I've heard him talk. And his his um his son is Bakari Sellers. Sometimes Bakari Sellers does commentary on MSNBC. And one thing that I I, I, I I've heard him say over and over again, the times I heard him speak and, you know, during like civil rights commemorations was that the people who was involved in act activism in the civil rights movement represented a, a, a minority of black people. And he said that, that the vast majority of black people who benefited from um, the work of those activists were never activists. They did not participate in the movements and what have you, you know what I mean? And uh, they reap the benefits of it, you know what I mean? So it's kind of like what we see with the aftermath of Black Lives Matter and how these corporations responded to Black Lives Matter. 
um, you know, where the corporate corporations decided to up their so-called diversity initiatives um, for people who were already well healed. You know what I'm saying? Right. Were not right. even involved involved in the, the you know grassroots you know street activity. You know, so man. it goes on and on. Bruh, that's you know, shout out to uh, Darren Seals, man. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Twenty one yeah, gun yeah, salute, yeah. bro. Twenty one yeah. gun salute. Thank you. I was about to say, you know, like, um, oh, oh, I was about to say, uh, that's actually a prime example when it said, um, uh, when Manny Jackson talked about the uh, communist corruption of, of the Negro intellectual and like, and how like, you know, there's like a lack of independent thinking. Again, prime case of what we're talking about, the embodiment of everything we're talking about as far as um, communist corruption of the Negro intelligentsia, um, so-called um, uh, black female grifters using black male suffering as like a grift, you know, for their own political gain, you know what I mean? And then trying to turn around and try to flip the conversation. Prime example of all of that, everything that we're talking about is Black Lives Matter. Yeah, Literally. and so let me, like, let me add what you're saying in terms of the communists. You know, the Richard Wright, he was at one time a member of the Communist Party in Chicago. And uh, Richard Wright, he uh, he wrote a whole book on it called The Outsider. And um, uh, he he broke with the Communist Party because of his racism. Um, not not just his racism, but he saw that the Communist Party um, and their you know their so called concern about the proletariat, um, you know their concern was fake. You know what I mean? And so they were only interested. So the Communist Party were interested. You know, let's say they're interested in, in, in sharecroppers in the South. Um, they were never really concerned about the 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 jacked up economic condition of the sharecroppers and what they dealt with day to day. They, they saw the sharecroppers basically as um, tools to advance their own interests, you understand? And so uh, the, 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 the Negro uh, peasant uh, is only useful to the degree that it advances their own goals, you know? And so in, 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 in their goals did not include a real critique or attack of Jim Crow, of racism, you know what I mean, and and so people like people like Richard Wright, they were able to see that they were able to see, um, you know, this type of cooptation, this kind of the type of fake allyship, of fake solidarity, and everything. Because when it came down to it, the Communist Party just didn't have a whole lot to say about race, um, and and that was the that was the the, the real you know, the real problem, man. And, and, you know, fast forward to today, man, you know, those dynamics, those dynamics have never left. You know, they have, they have, they have, they have, they've been a part of the left. I put like that, the left. <laughs> right, those right. dynamics have never left the left, you know. Yeah, so, you know, like at the end of the day, man, you know, the only thing I wanted to do today, and I'm about to close it out because we have the two hour mark plus, right. you know, we're pushing it. And what's um, the name of that book, by the way? Um, it was called The Outsider. The Outsider by yeah. Richard Wright. Yeah, it's okay. a novel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, I do believe um, the novel The Invisible Man, um, even though I, I got to take the time to finish reading it, mm -hmm. The Invisible Man talks about that same thing. Yeah. I'll be more of a fictional story, yeah, about mm -hmm. uh, how it's centered around fake concern. And it's amazing how Ralph Waldo Emerson, Richard Wright, Manny Johnson, they stiffed this shit out 55 years ago. It was like, yeah, yeah, these motherfuckers are fake, yet we're still here in 2023 talking about some, well, you know, uh, we can't, you know, we got to tiptoe around the issue. I'm like, for what? The people who said it at the height of Jim Crow, at, at the height of the civil rights movement was telling you these people were fake. And now, you know what I mean? We're afraid to call them out now. Like, well, fuck all that, you know? It's, man, look, all you got to do is look at where motherfuckers live and the kind of shit that they do, man. You know what I'm saying? Not to say, look, I'm, I'm just keep it a buck here, man. On an individual level, I know some cool ass white people, right? Not just not trying to be disrespectful, but like let's keep it a buck, man. The motherfuckers ain't they ain't they ain't they ain't putting their life on the line, they dick on the chopping block to come where you at. Most often, I ain't gonna say ain't none of them ain't never came. Cause some of them have come to where I'm at or where I'm from and help me move shit, you know, here and there and come sit and chat with me and shit and don't have a problem with it. But most of them, they scared to come around, bro. Yeah. It's just the facts, man. No disrespect, but it's just it is what it is. You know what and I'm saying? We, like, you know, like, and, and but but at the end of the day, the only thing I tried to do 
was to say, hey, man, let's take another look at intersectionality. I know from time to time I have to repeat and go over things that I've spoken on before, and if only to enrich what I've already said and sometimes so that people don't forget. But today what I wanted to do is try to talk about it, how initially it was perceived as a means of assessing interracial oppression from the angle of, you know, a, a worker objecting to what they consider to be discriminatory practices of, of corporations, and then how it transmorphed into something entirely different. It became dominance feminism and, you know, a clarion call for white people to rally behind protecting black women from being brutalized by black boogeymen, okay? And now I think we're still at the moment to where black men are being typecast and caricaturized as boogeymen. And, you know, like black women need to be saved from us. Like, and it's utilized mm -hmm. as a means by which to approximate, one, you know, there's, you know, these women's uh, interests to that of white folks and to secure positions of, of economics and power, man. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, and social status. Now, look. Get it how you live, man. But don't throw me under the bus to get it, man. That's all I'm saying. Like, and the only thing that must be acknowledged is the shit that they say that makes them victims is the same shit that they do themselves at nearly the same rates as black men. So don't bastardize and boogie me and us. Talk about the, the real pathology that exists in our neighborhoods and the kind of causes of it or the correlates related to it. Don't just put it, don't pin the, don't, the tail on us and make us into be jackasses while y'all act like y'all, you know, innocent, you know, benevolent beings who couldn't hurt flies and you just, just oh. so happen to be, you know, close to or in the proximity of fucking, you know, the, the savage beast. And the man, and then you talking about your daddies. Your brothers and your sons and your nephews and your uncles and shit. Now I'm not well, saying like, black women are inherently evil. I'm, I'm not. That's not the, the the point. The point is, stop trying to typecast us as the boogeyman to big up yourself. Throw us under the bus so you can get some peanuts and some baubles and shit. Don't do that, man. And I'm gonna say the last thing. The last thing I say is that what's so uh, comical about this is that. The people who articulate this stuff, you know, at, at a high level, they don't live around black people. They don't live around Man. black men. So you're talking about women who we know um, typically are not married. Many of them don't have kids. All right. They live in an all white world. OK. Um, they, they own homes in white neighborhoods, you know, go to school to work with white people. They have white friends. So I'm like, where is this boogeyman that y'all talking about? If you got some bourgeois, you got some bourgeois woman who for, for the bulk of her adult life or in her adult life, ever, her dominant interactions are with white people, not with black men, okay? So I'm like, where is this boogeyman that you are so fearful of that you need all this protection and you need all this salvation and everything? Where is he? Where, 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 where is he? You know, it ain't like you got Keisha writing these books. Or you ain't got Tasha writing these books. You know what I'm saying? You know, you, you got women who don't even want to sit in the same room with Keisha and Tasha. <laughs> but they act like they crunk as a motherfucker, like your girl. I forget her name. I can't even remember her name right now. And like they hood as a motherfucker. Like they straight oh, black. Lord. Like they, you know, like they all up in the hood like a motherfucker. Oh, like, man, y'all are not God. around the hood, bro. I mean, I'm I'm just keeping it a buck, man. Like, I, bro, I done seen a lot. I'm not going I don't I'm not mad at black folks for being middle class. I'm not. But what fucks me up is is when they, you know, black bourgeois people act as if they're the embodiment of radical politics, man. Cut the bullshit out, man. Just stop that, man. Cut it out, man. Just stop it, man. Man, cut that shit out. So anyway, man, I'm about yeah, to break I, I, it I, off. I think we go ahead, Kev, man. Oh yeah, I was about to say, yeah, like uh, I didn't want to, you know, interrupt you, you know, I was cuz the show but um, one part that uh, I think Everett Anderson said, um, and I think he makes a good point, is that, you know, the reason why they hate this space is because, you know, us giving pushback, you know, the bottom line is this, uh, you know, basically blaming so-called black men is not going to lead to salvation anymore. 
that whole narrative of how, you know, if we just, you know, if we just get rid of so-called, you know, black men, if we, if we basically typecast us, if we negatively propagandize so-called, you know, brothers in America, that it's going to lead to some sort of societal uplifting and enlightenment, man, that shit's not happening. What's going to happen is that they're either going to get debunked as liars and grifters. Um, I'm sorry, they're either going to lose credibility. No, I'm sorry, they're going to lose popu- either popularity or they're going to lose credibility. But you're not going to be able to do the whole blame and shame game with us and still be able to maintain a facade of intellectual and moral superiority. Like, no, you're going to get exposed as a carpetbagger, as a grifter, as somebody who's just, you know, uh, somebody, you know, basically looking to kiss ass. And going back to the the, the conversation we had the other day about so-called pro-black, the thing that most people are going to have to realize is that most of the people nowadays claim to be pro-black are either pro-black because they, I'm going to put it, the people that are pro-black are people that claim you know, pro-blackness because they spent their working career between 18 and 35, 18 and 40, either running the streets, um, either putting women on a pedestal or by, you know, basically kissing white people's ass and begging for white validation. And now they, and now that they've basically eaten shit and they have a bunch of egg on their face, now they want to basically have some type of retroactive uh, of dignity by claiming to be woke and claiming to be pro black and claiming to be community oriented. And that's what you're seeing starting to manifest. Um, there's a reason why guys like Brother Panic, who, by, again, is in no way affiliated with the space whatsoever, um, he's in like the conscious space. That's the reason why he has a very um, hostile and condescending viewpoint towards the m- most people who claim to be uh, pro black and Afrocentric because he's witnessed firsthand, um, like guys like Richard Wright. And Manning Johnson, they witnessed firsthand how the majority of it is simply performative. They don't actually believe it. It's just a way of them to try to either um, escape criticism themselves or as a way of them trying to put the onus on other people to do all the hard work and all the sacrifice for them, you know? So. I hear you, bro. Well, you know, look, I'm going to say this. I am pro-black. Um, however, I'm not pro-black with blinders on. So, you know, uh, I, I mean, you know, cause what's the, what's the, what's the opposite of, of pro-black? I'm not pro-white. Now, I mean, you know, I'm not, it's not like I'm against white folks all together where I feel like they're, you know, they need to be dehumanized, but like they need to be held accountable for the fucked up shit they did and continue to do. Yep. You know what I'm yep. saying? So, but, but at the end of the day, like, you know, like I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to denounce uh, you know, black folks uh, and throw black folks under the bus in order to, you know, to demonstrate that somehow, you know, like the most pathological or the most unfortunate or so-called quote-unquote subcultural blacks, I'm not going to throw them under the bus in order to make myself look good or to endear myself, you know, or get close to white folks. That's not the fucking game I'm playing, okay? Uh, so to some extent, I am, pro- like, what's the opposite of pro I'm not anti-black. You get what I'm saying? So, so uh, you know, but but I'm not uh, pro-black with, with you know, like, rose goggles on, you know, rose-colored yeah, glasses yeah. on. You understand what and I'm I saying? And I think what a Keeper 100 said it best, you know what I mean? Hey, listen, bro, um, he basically said it on his live stream yesterday. He said, hey, listen, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, I'm not delusional. I'm not going to talk about, you know, the past, uh, the, the past accomplishments of uh, so-called uh, black people from, from civilizations past. I'm not just going to just rant and pontificate about that. Neither am I going to be out there trying to wave the flag for the other side. I'm like, listen, I'm all about taking practical means, you know, to save myself and then offer some helpful information, you know, where I can. I'm not, but I'm not about to sit up there and try to like, you know what I mean, ingratiate myself to people that clearly don't fuck with me either, you know? So look here, man, look, we didn't talk, you know, we didn't talk to nothing. I'm getting hungry. Uh, I put out a little short video out there for all you young motherfuckers out there that's out of shape. I'm almost 52, motherfucker. If I can do 15 pull-ups, get your ass, go to the Walmart, get you a pull-up, boy, man. Start getting your ass in shape, boy. You understand what I'm saying? 
So anyway, shout out to uh, Be About Peace and Pleasure. He says what you're saying is true. There's a Christian university named Grand Canyon University on the west side of Phoenix that's doing that right now. Talking about the gentrification. I know it's an old comment, but shout out to that brother, man. Peace out to him. Also, shout out to Mr. Me Too. Salute the Black Man and Spirit Show of the Week. Support Black Men Media, especially the PhDs. Word and deed. It's true and deed. Bond and all that shit. You know what I'm saying? Word is bond. All that. But anyway, man, look. Holla at y'all, man. Uh, glad that you know y'all could come visit me today. You know, I know this was impromptu. I didn't really plan for it. I wanted to talk about inse intersectionality sometime this week, though, but I just didn't have all the pieces of the puzzle put together the same way that I wanted to. But, you know, uh, you know, we make do, man. We, we you know, we got to come off the dome sometimes. So that's what I did this afternoon, man. But anyway, man, y'all be peaceful, man. I'll holler at y'all on the next one. I'll be back tomorrow, baby. Holler at you.